Are we streaming? We are live. We are live. Okay, very good. So good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, everybody's looking fine and well. Um, we'll open the open the meeting with a karakia, and then we'll crack into it. Kia tau te ragi Maria, kia whakapapa punamu te moana, e huarahi ma tato ia te rangi nei, aroha atu aroha mai, tato ia a tato kato, hui e taiki e. So morning everybody uh, and uh, welcome to, there's probably not anyone quite watching yet, but uh, um, welcome to our first live council meeting um, and it's taken us to, to get to a COVID type scenario to, to have that, but maybe uh, in the future we'll be able to broadcast live for our council chambers, which will be um, something awesome to, to give out to the community. So with the um, minutes being open, I'll call for apologies and I don't think we've got any apologies. Uh, declarations of late items. I have no knowledge of any late items. Declarations of interest. And then we'll move into the confirmation of the council minutes from the 24th of March. Can we have somebody move that those a true and accurate record? Thank you, Councillor Paul Milner. Thank you, Councillor Reno Wilkinson. Any matters arising, we'll just quickly run through it. Page five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Ten. 11, 12, public excluded on 13, 14, public re-admitted on page 15 and the close of the meeting. So move into our first uh, agenda item and the chief executive's monthly report. Can we have somebody move that we receive the report? Thank you, Councillor Tilsley. Thank you, Councillor Spicer. All those in favour? Carried. Morning, Langley. Yeah, good morning, uh, Your Worship, and morning, Councillors. Um, firstly, apologies for um, the bottom end of the report um, being missed in the agenda um, uh, package. And um, it has um, been uh, separately circulated um, with the completed section. Uh, just starting off on um, recruitment, um, obviously with the lockdown, that's um, really been on, on hold. Um, we are though still um, proceeding with the uh, appointment of a treatment technician with our water services team. So obviously that's a critical service and um, it's one that we want to maintain our, um, our um, staff numbers. We've had a number of um, staff fared well during this period, obviously without the normal um, farewell um, um, procedure being followed. But um, Chris uh, Linkletter has resigned as our senior building control officer and that's a role that we will be um, we're looking at um, trying to fill. Um, he'd been with our uh, council for 19 years. Ross Death, um, one of our reticulation service people who would be sadly missed, um, has also um, gone after 19 years. Um, one of our treatment technicians, Clive McRae, um, has moved on um, and will be leaving us, um, will left us on um, 15th of April. And our development engineer um, will be leaving us um, from a technical business unit. Um, we had some um, changes, as um, I guess many um, around New Zealand will have. One staff member um, was planning on some travel, and um, um, that has now um, been cancelled, so um, it's not happening. And um, we've had um, obviously been the, um, uh, looking at a number of policies as we've been working through the COVID 19. Um, a, around working um, in our essential services, but making sure we're keeping the staff safe. 
and um, those that um, could not work from home, um, we have been granting special leave. Um, just to uh, monitor how staff are faring up under these um, um, new and interesting conditions, um, we have undertaken um, two surveys um, and with the first one has come back and you can see some of the comments there that um, you know, with the support structures we've put in place and I guess um, the, the recently um, good communications we have going um, that they are at this stage feeling well supported. We've just completed the second survey, haven't got the results yet, looking at the transition and how they're feeling um, going through that transition. Um, the, uh, the second item I report's around the COVID-19 update. Um, and look, I'll just take that as, as read. You can see the services that um, we are providing under level three. Um, we, um, you know, primarily our offices have, have stayed closed, but we are getting out um, and doing a lot of physical works, construction works, et cetera, and getting back to some normality. Um, great to be able to get in and maintain our parks and reserves um, um, before, um, we end up where we may perhaps lose some of our better services. Um, happy to take any um, questions um, um, on that, that report. Councillor Smeaton. Has there been any problem with the toilets being public toilets being closed? Has there been any kind of issues as a result of that? Um, so they're not all closed, um, and um, we've um, had to maintain um, a, a, a set number with um, to allow for those moving through our community doing um, essential services. But I'm not aware of any um, issues. Um, I'd have to look at David Varco um, shaking his head. No, no, we've had no real no real issues. Um, Any other questions for, for Langley? We'll go Councillor Broad and then uh, Councillor Gentle. Thank you, Toby. Uh, Langley, just regards the resignation of Chris Linklater with the building department, we know that they're under pressure uh, to get things done in statutory times. Will, the, will, in the meantime, short of getting people to fulfill that position, will you guys outsource to make sure we keep on top of that um, and redeploy staff so that they're still doing inspections? Um, yes, so we, we outsource in that area um, already. Um, so we have um, a number of uh, outsourced staff, um, uh, but we will endeavour to make sure we've got addition, you know, sufficient resource and outsource resource um, staff to keep up with the, the workload and try and meet those statutory timeframes. We appreciate it's very, um, you know, the building industry wants to get back and going and doesn't want any impediments from us um, in terms of being able to do their work. Thank you. Councillor Gentle. You'll need to unmute, Brian. Okay, I'll keep pushing the button again and again. Okay, that's better. Apologies for that. Um, just a quick question, Langley, in regards to the numbers of staff. Obviously, with what's happened with COVID-19, uh, et cetera, we're we keeping a close eye on that, obviously replacing people that we need to, um, but not necessarily long-term, or are they on contract? Is there sort of a looking at that to sort of save pennies? And great comments from people working at home. Do we have many negatives? Um, very few. Very few uh, out of, um, um, gosh, I would have thought uh, one to 200 comments, um, just a couple where um, some people weren't enjoying working from home. Um, and it really depended on, on the, the nature of the work they were doing. That's pretty good, um, eh? Yes, no, we were, we were quite happy. And um, obviously the, um, uh, we need to give some thought now about the new norm around um, you know, how people are working um, we have been um, challenged at times with office space, um, but um, what um, I guess my observation has been we've had some great productivity um, with people working from home and um, it's something that we'll look at um, um, in the future is perhaps um, um, doing more of it. As, as I think across the country, there's going to be a general trend in that area. And I think it's, a, it's incumbent upon us not to um, just go back to what we were doing before. Uh, after situations like this, it's to, to review how things went and um, what could the future look like. 
Langley, just on, on behalf of all the councillors, um, could you just thank all the staff? I mean, they've, they've been through this process like, like everybody else, and it's uh, something new and challenging and uh, at times stressful, um, not knowing what's going on. Um, and there's people out there that have been busting to mow lawns and uh, keep the place looking beautiful. Uh, they take a lot of pride in that. So uh, just on behalf of all of us, just, just thank the staff for, for bearing with us and uh, putting up with us and uh, what will be the new new um, will be something a little bit different uh, as we go forward. So uh, thanks a lot for that. Thank you. So if there's no further questions for Langley, we'll move on to the next report. And it doesn't appear to be. So just uh, on page 18 of your agenda, uh, the financial report for the period to 31st of March, 2020. Councillor Daly, are you happy to receive the report? Thank you, Carol. And do we have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Gentle. All those in favour? Against Kerry. Thank you. Good morning, Duncan. How are you and your team faring? Kerry. Um, um, yeah, well, it seems to be pretty good, actually. Most people, most of that, as Langley said, most people are, are enjoying working from home. Um, and, and most have been able to. Uh, I think probably the IT team have been the main ones who um, who had to be a little bit more available, um, and particularly in terms of supporting the water, the water team. Um, so just to to look at the report on page 18. Um, so this is a, a, the financial report. It's very similar result to last month. Um, overall, we're about 95,000 um, better off than we were last month. So as a as a the net picture, um, and there's a number of ups and downs in that, um, but the major difference is um, some additional uh, roading subsidy income that's come in in the last month. Um, just towards the bottom of um, page 18, it looks at um, our non-rates revenue. Uh, as you see, it's tracking um, un uh, under budget. It's actually tracking, uh, sorry, it's uh, an error there. It's actually tracking over budget. Uh, and the main areas there uh, around uh, roading subsidies uh, and, and some wastewater subsidy that were received as well. Um, so on on um, page 19, um, towards the bottom of page 19, there's a, a, an item there around um, capital works budget adjustments. Um, so the first item there is for the Victoria Street wastewater pump station, uh, and and um, staff came to council and asked for a, a budget of 165,000. Uh, unfortunately, when we were preparing the the annual plan, um, the the generator part of this of this project was omitted, and it was um, the, the budget was reduced to um, to 90,000. Um, and so all we're asking here is, is just for that budget to be um, restored to the original 165,000. Uh, I'll deal with the next item and then maybe ask for questions after that. Um, on, also on page 20, um, there's uh, the budget that was approved for the wastewater scheme for, um, for Kangahake. And um, when that budget was being approved, um, staff admitted to recognise work that had already been done towards that project. Uh, that had actually been done a, a year or so prior to the start, which was um, when we were setting up the water supply for the, uh, or, or um, hooking the Karangahe water supply up to the pyro water supply, we took the opportunity to lay um, some pipes there in, in preparation for the, the sort of scheme as well. Um, so this, this is just recognising that part of that project that had been admitted from the original budget. Um, so are there any questions on that, on either of those items? Councillor Smeaton, um, could, could someone explain to me, or is that clapping, is it? Yeah, that's same, same thing, it's, it's okay. Can someone explain yeah. to me what a low flow, high pressure sewer system looks like? What's the story there? Oh. We'll pass over to Adrian for that one. A little bit more um, <laughs> quick to answer that one. Through you, Your Worship. Um, Councillor Smeaton, what it is, is, is that um, it means that a lot of people can connect onto the system and they have a pump that's able to pump at a very high pressure, but very low flow. So we have a pipeline all the way back to um, Paro from Karangahek and Mackie Town. And it means that all of those communities can connect onto it um, using a pump station that's got a very high pressure um, and um, they just pump their, their, their low flow. So um, it, it's a system that's been used quite extensively, especially in Christchurch following the um, rebuild. 
um, because of the flexibility and the ability for other people to connect onto it. Normally what you would have is, is that you'd have a pump that's, uh, you put in a big pump and a big pump and um, the pump will have a much lower pressure. But um, these are designed for individual properties able to pump all the way back to power. Or, so they've got a big head to overcome, but they very low flows. Does that explain it? So I guess um, the, the key feature, uh, Council Smeden, is that um, you don't use gravity to convey the sewage around. So you don't have to lay um, larger diameter mains with a fall from manhole to manhole then to a pump station. You have a small diameter main that's laid flat and um, you pump, every house pumps into it. So it um, can be a very inexpensive way of achieving the same outcome. No further questions on that one. So uh, Duncan, oh, sorry, Councillor Ray Broad. Uh, thanks, Toby. Um, just clarification, the extra money for this wastewater scheme, you said the pipes are already laid uh, with the water scheme. Does that mean that really what you're doing is transferring uh, funds out of one budget to another? So that means that essentially the other budget should be reducing or the cost in the other budget should be reducing by the same amount. So effectively, we're not signing off any extra expenditure. We're just changing figures between two budgets. Uh, no, no. So it, was a, um, it wasn't charged to the water supply um, budget. Um, but it was a call we made at the time where um, laying the two pipes in the same trench um, saved us a significant money. But the, um, the cost was incurred, um, but we just um, um, it didn't show in the project costs at the time that that report was put through to council. But it wasn't charged to water. Okay, thank you. Uh, more questions. So, Duncan, have you carry on with your report? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, just I'll skip to the um, the capital works on on page twenty four. Um, the, the chart there showing progress against the um, annual plan budget. Um, so, the I'll wait for one second. So, the blue line is the the forecast uh, that that we had in terms of how close we were to actually hit our. Um, the, the red annual plan budget line. Um, and obviously with the way things have gone, we've really missed the last, I suppose, six weeks of the, the dry weather and the, and the construction period. Um, so there are a number of projects that aren't likely to be completed by the end of the year. I, I don't have any specific detail, but so that's just a, it was just a general comment. Um, and I'll, I'll take the rest of the report as read um, and just ask are there any questions. Thanks. Any further questions? Councillor Melnart. Absolutely brilliant question, Paul, but um, if you could repeat it with your with your mic working, that'd be uh, even more fantastic. Right now. Yeah, that's... Yeah, we actually preferred it the other way, but... Um, All right, fair enough. Um, page, fine. thank you, page 27, um, refuse collection costs tracking above. We've heard about that one previously, but with reserves and things being closed, is there some easing in that budget so the overspend might not be as great as what we first thought? Uh, I, I, sorry, I don't have any specific information on that, David. Are you able to respond? Um, So the, the bins, um, good morning, councillor and councillors. Um, the bins have been continued to be um, emptied. I don't have any exact numbers on uh, where there's been a reduction in, in waste, but I do know that that uh, service has continued. Any further questions for, for Duncan on his report? So no further questions. There's uh, one resolution there that council resolves to increase the capital expenditure budget for the Victoria Street wastewater station generator back to that approved on the 31st of October 2018 of 165,000 and the council receives the increase of the capital expenditure budget. 
for the wastewater scheme. Is somebody happy to move that? Thank you, Councillor Harris. Thank you, Councillor Sarah Howe. All those in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Gary. Thank you, councillors. So page 30 of our agenda, the adoption of the uh, annual plan report to council. Somebody moved that we receive the report. Thank you, councillor Buckwell. Thank you, councillor Anderson. All those in favour? Against Kerry. Who's the brave one that wants to take us through this one? Is that you, Langley? Or Duncan? This is a Duncan report. <coughs> um, th thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, so this report is to, to finally adopt the, the, the 2021 annual plan and, and a number of other resolutions that, that relate to that that we have to pass. As part of the process, um, I, I would like to acknowledge the the, the extra work uh, load that has uh, been carried out by uh, by the finance team, by Steve Baker and Norman, particularly Steve Baker and Norman Vinadell, and and or again the strategic planning team, um, particularly um, Terry and, and Jolene, who have been the main ones involved in this. Um, it's been a it's been a, a, a it's been a really good process, um, and uh, we've been able to incorporate a lot of the the, um, the recommendations from council. Um, so the highlights, I suppose, on to just go through some of the highlights on page um, 32 of the report. Uh, it details the, the, the revised um, rates increases. So we had originally been proposing for, for non-water rates, we'd been proposing 5.43% increase, uh, and we've been able to reduce that to 3.9, uh, as, as discussed at the workshop. Um, and also the water rates we've been able to reduce from 6% down to 3%. Um, page 33 um, talks about some of the um, other resolutions that we need to pass. So as, as part of um, adopting the annual plan and, and setting the rates for the new year, we actually have to pass a separate rates resolution um, to, to recognise the rates that are all also detailed in the annual plan. Um, so there's, there's that resolution to pass, and it's uh, attached as an appendix. Um, uh, another thing that we we do do as part of this process is um, council delegates authority to me to borrow up to a certain amount, um, which is really the amount that's talked about in the annual plan, um, plus a margin because obviously the the annual plan balances are just showing the balance at 30 June, and obviously the, the debt can be a little bit up, and up or down compared to that date. So the, the amount we're talking about borrowing there is, is up to 56 million. Um, the, the beginning debt forecast is 53 million, uh, and we're allowing $3 million extra as well. So it's just to um, allow me to go and do that work, and then if, if anything um, came out of the woodwork, then I would have to come back to council to be able to borrow more than that. Um, our debt current debt cap in the annual plan is, is just a smidgen under 70 million. Um, it also under that um, on that page 33, the item 3.2.3, we um, where council has to um, pass a resolution where it doesn't balance its budget or, or it's, uh, it has a um, it's showing a deficit or a surplus. Um, in this case, we're showing an overall surplus, um, but in some specific activities, we're showing a, a deficit, and it's I suppose part of our rate smoothing process where we. Rather than having the rates go up and down from, from year to year, we, we try and um, draw a, a sort of straight line through the increases that are required. So there are four activities that are, that are showing deficits, so being land transport, land drainage, leadership and, and corporate. Um, and obviously the other surplus is the highest, but that's just not setting that. Um, um, we could talk about the, uh, well, sorry, we'll probably we'll talk about the items that were the other items that was discussed, discussed in the workshop. Um, but are there any questions so far on, on any of that? Councillor Smeaton, you have a question? Um, Duncan, uh, you may have already answered this, but um, Council considers it prudent to run deficits in these activities. Why don't you just uh, increase the budget items so you don't run deficits? Why, why plan to run a deficit? Because you, you, your overall budget's balanced anyway. So I, I don't sort of see quite why you're doing that. 
So those those activities are, are funded separately. Um, so land uh, land land drainage is a good example. So land drainage, 15% of the funding from that comes from the district rate, but 85% comes from the, the specific land drainage rate for, for each of the drainage districts. Um, and, and rather than have an increase, um, you know, we we typically would increase. So rather than have an increase of 10% one year, typically we would say, well, let's increase it 5%. You know, in, in each of two years to get to the position that we need to get to. Um, so occasionally in those circumstances, you have deficits. Um, the, the other instance that you can have is uh, where uh, there, there's a one-off cost in, in a particular year um, that, that's beyond the normal, and so we think it's what's well, sensible to run a, a small deficit in that year, uh, and, and it'll be covered by the surplus the following year. A question from uh, Anne-Marie Spicer, uh, Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer, is on page 34, rates holidays. What will be the criteria for allowing rates holidays and who, who decides this criteria? Um, so that was part of the discussion in the um, in the, the workshop and the position we'd agreed upon, uh, I think it was a, a agreed upon was where the, which was a Christchurch model, Christchurch City Council model, where um, similar to the um, the, the wage subsidy sort of rules for the government. So um, if a business's income is dropped by 30% uh, or if um, a, a person in a household has, has lost, say if it's residential rates, if a person has, um, has lost their job or that the household income is down by 20%. Uh, sorry, the other thing to emphasise it's upon application to council. So um, people do have to come and talk to the race team. That's something we really want to emphasise. Yeah, we've certainly been encouraging that as much as we can. That if uh, anybody's experiencing any hardships of any any type, to to make contact with council um, as early as possible to start working through and talking through those issues. Any other questions, councillors? Before we Duncan moves on. Thanks, Duncan. You can carry on. Right. Um, so, just there aren't um, many, there aren't really specific rec uh, resolutions required for um, the, the recommendations that came out of the workshop. Um, some of them there will be, but uh, there, there's uh, some of the, the shit, or some of the topics covered in that plan. Uh, still, uh, there's still reports to come to council on. Um, so most of them are sort of already covered by the rates remission policies, or, or, or um, there is a the, the the penalty remission policies gives quite a lot of um, quite a, a broad reaching delegation to me in terms of writing off penalties, um, yeah, but that was certainly something we wanted to cover off in, um, in the workshop and make sure that council um, that, that I had a clear steer from you in terms of what sort of approach you wanted to take. Um, one thing we didn't um, I'm not sure that we came to a final decision on was the the, uh, the penalty amount. So for next year, um, council uh, in their workshop the recommendation was to reduce the penalty to um, the penalty rate from 10% to 5%, uh, and, and that's covered as part of the annual plan adoption resolution that we have here. Um, but there is also the penalty uh, that will be applied to the the last instalment for this year. So the the rates bills are going out. Uh, in, in two days' time, and they'll be due towards the end of April. Uh, and if any of those are outstanding, then typically we would charge a 10% penalty. Um, so it's, it's not a simple matter to to to, to just reduce it to 5%, but there's a way we can, we can use the remission policy to achieve the same outcome. So I suppose I was wanting a steer from, uh, from councillors as to um, did you want a, an effective 5% penalty applied to, to outstanding rates on that or the, or the normal 10%. Well, certainly not 10%. Um, I, I've been, the 5% makes sense and that's just about cost recovery. Um, and that's the that's last resort. That's before um, prior to anybody bringing in and, and deferring payments or um, talking about payment plans. So that's, that's solely for, in, in regards to people that just don't make any contact or don't make any effort or just don't pay at all. Is that, that's what you're referring to, isn't it, Duncan? 
that, that's correct. Yes, so certainly if people ring in, um, then we're able to put in a, a well, in effect, to apply that rates holiday to them as long as they meet those criteria. And, and people who don't ring in or don't meet the criteria, then we would apply a, a an effective five percent penalty fee. Councillor Broad. Uh, thanks, Toby. Yeah, I agree that five percent should be implemented now. Um, I think you're going to find people are going to find it hard. Uh, straight away rather than uh, waiting for a few months to sort of uh, mop it up if there is a problem. But yeah, like you, they need to make contact with the council, put a plan into place, and this is a position of last resort anyway. Any any questions for, for Duncan on that? Is there any, any more clarification required? Are you happy with that, Duncan? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Just, just so um, Council is aware, the, the rates invoices, um, will, it, will that go out? Um, we've already had to prepare them. So they will say that um, a 10% penalty will be applied. Um, and, and in theory, that's what will happen, but we'll, we'll remit it down to 5%. So effectively, we'll charge 5 but the, the invoice at the moment says 10%. Um, so I suppose, that, were there any... Um, was there any further discussion that was wanting to be had on the the, uh, the recommendations made by the, the the workshop? Can you just, uh, Carol, could you bring up the um, the screen with the recommendation so that councillors can? Uh, it's got a few recommendations there. Let's give everyone a quick chance to read through all those before we um, start asking for any movers. Yes, there's more questions. Can we um, get a page, please? Oh, sorry, page sort of 33 and, and page 34, most of page 34. Oh, sorry, and 35. So the actual recommendations, Councillor Gentle, are on the front at the start of the report. Page 31. 31. The resolution 31, sorry. Yep. Okay, so I've, uh, it's been moved by Councillor Paul Milner. Uh, Councillor Philip Bucklot is happy to second. Uh, and you're happy to move and second uh, all those recommendations as a whole. Uh, Councillor Milner and Councillor Bucklot. Yes, thank you. There's no more further questions on that. I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you, Duncan and uh, Langley, Peter and Adrian. Uh, that workshop was certainly beneficial to um, come to the recommendations of the annual plan that we've got. Um, and while we've heard a lot from, from other councils, um, mixed messages from central government, one minute it's zero rates, one minute it's not zero rates. Um, had a lengthy conversation yesterday at the Mural Forum with an uh, uh, enthusiastic academic um, and uh, he gave us his point of view. Um, but the way that we've done it, I think is um, the, the most prudent way of going forward and uh, not, not putting the financial burden just later on and pushing it down further off. So uh, um, I've had to, any response um, through the messaging that we've put out that will be going about it the right way from our residents and ratepayers. So uh, well done, councillors. We've, we've, we've done a great job, I believe. So thank you. Okay, we move to page 144. So just for all those that are watching, all the pages from 31 to 44 was the uh, the, the annual plan um, part of the report. So um, that's why there's a big jump. So we're not scoping stuff. So page 144, um, the LGA borrowing documents. Uh, somebody move, Carol, are you happy to move that we receive this report? Thank you. Can we have a second? Uh, thank you, Councillor Spicer. All those in favour? Thanks, Carrie. Duncan. Is... Um, thank you, and, and um, apologies, but I don't think I've ever been responsible for um, 350 pages of, the, uh, of an agenda before. Um, so, again, uh, this is a, quite a long report. Um, the summary really is on, on page 144. 
Um, the LGFA obviously are the organisation I'm sure you're aware that we borrow from, um, and they have asked to make some some changes in the way that they lend to councils. Um, generally, these are actually at, at request from from councils, uh, and there's four changes there that are the, the four key changes. Um, the, the first is to enable um, CCOs or, or council controlled organisations to borrow from the LGFA directly. Um, they'll only be able to do this where the parent council offers a guarantee for that borrowing. Um, so, for example, Auckland Auckland Council you know, have uh, water care and Auckland Transport. Um, so currently, Auckland Council um, will actually borrow from LGFA and then on lend that to to those to water care, etc. Uh, and this really allows them to to do that direct to, to, for those CCOs to be able to borrow from LGFA directly. Again where Auckland Council has provided a, a guarantee for those borrowings. Um, the second point um, is to um, allow to, to allow our council um, to apply to the LGFA to have their debts tested at a group level. Um, so again, the Auckland Council example, um, the, the, the test then would be applied over Auckland Council, including water care and Auckland <coughs> Transport. Um, so this is something that the council have to apply to be able to do, and LGRA actually have to agree to do that. The, the main reason for doing this is because um, other other organisations like Standard and Poor's who give um, credit ratings to councils, um, they they actually take this approach. So it's really to line up with that. Um, the the third item is to increase the amount of borrow notes that that um, must be issued to a, a council when it's borrowing from the LGFA. So, the, so what actually happens at the moment, um, the LGFA sort of operate as a bank and they need a certain amount of capital to be um, on, on their balance sheet to back up the borrowings that they're lending. Um, and the Reserve Bank have increased the requirement for, for the amount of capital that banks have to hold. Um, they did this shortly before COVID. I think they've actually released uh, relaxed things a little bit since then. Um, but so to the, uh, um, in effect, uh, uh, arranging for councils to um, increase the amount of borrow, uh, the amount of borrow notes that they uh, that they issue to LGFA at the same time as they borrow. Um, so that's a, a, a common thing. I so there's, there's a request from the treasury, uh, and there's sort of some other minor minor technical amendments that um, LGFA have actually asked for to make the process a little bit easier as well. Um, so that the the shareholders of LGFA are all councils, uh, and, and there is a shareholders council that make recommendations to the board, uh, and the shareholders council are, are recommending all these changes. Uh, they've all been, um, obviously, have gone through um, LGFA's lawyers who are Russell McVeigh, and the shareholders council have um, have had Simpson Grierson and review all the documents, um, and they're asking all councils um, who are shareholders of LGFA to approve these um, documents. Um, uh, we do actually require a couple of councils to be able to, to sign the documentation. Um, other than that, are there, are there any questions? Questions? Councillor Daly, have you had a chance to read through all this? Mm, you might just need to unmute your your microphone there. Me, Toby, I have spent quite some time going through it all. Um, it is it is quite complex, but I have a, the basic understanding of what's going on. I've been over it with um, Duncan, um, and I intend to go um, make myself more aware of some of the things that uh, are quite technical and will uh, take more time to come to um, a better understanding with it, but I, the basic idea I do understand. Awesome, thank you, Councillor Daly. Is there any questions for, for Duncan or um, Councillor Daly? Councillor Broad? Thanks, um, Toby. Um, you referred to CCOs. What uh, CCOs does Haraki District Council currently have and would we be in a position that we're going to allow them to apply for funding direct without council going through council? 
Um, so so currently, uh, we, we do have some we do have some CCOs, but there are no CCOs that are I think directly owned by by Hauraki District Council. Um, there are some that are some that are owned um, by us as as part of a group. Um, so an example of that is the the, uh, the, the Waikato Less, which are the subject of the next report. Um, I don't think there's any intention. Uh, I'm certainly not aware of any intention at all to to lend to any of our CCOs at the moment. Thank you. Any other questions, councillors? There's a, there's a, I hope you all read the next 200 pages of um, Duncan's report. So far that's about 300 pages or nearly 400 pages that Duncan's presented. That's, that's quite a new feat, Duncan. You're, you're doing well. So if we go back to uh, the recommendations, we've got two options. So option one is, uh, as Duncan explained, or option two is the, the status quo. So could I have a mover? Carol, Councillor Daly, I'm looking for you for a... Um, you're happy to move option one? Yes, I am. Thank you, Councillor Daly. We have a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Buckthorpe. All those in favour of option one of the report? Thank you. Any against? Kerry. Well done, Duncan. We're, we're getting through the agenda now. <laughs> Thank you. We can uh, scoot on down to page 342, councillors. <coughs> So Waikato Lass, the 2020 Statement of Intent. I'll move that we uh, receive the report. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Councillor Gentle. All those in favour? Against carried. Duncan, are you going to take us through this one? Um, yes, thank you, me, Toby. So um, page 342, uh, really just taking the report as read, I suppose. On, on page 342, it's just the five initiatives that um, why are less actually looking looking into investigating more for the future? Uh, and on page 343, there's a list there of the, the major activities I suppose that why are less are already <laughs> carrying out. Um, other than that, are there any any questions? No questions. Councillor Anne Marie. Um, I did ask Langley if you wouldn't mind just giving us a really brief uh, overview of what LAS has done for Hauraki District Council in 2019 and what you think it will do for us in 2020 and going forward as well. So um, um, Waikato LAS has, um, um, I guess, hasn't done it recently a summary of, of the work um, or the benefits of the work it's been involved with. But in 2018, and I think I'd um, given a link to that um, document, it was quite a detailed um, information sheet they provided to all shareholders. Um, the sort of more significant things that the Waikato Lass are doing for us at the moment is they're managing the uh, Waikato uh, Regional Asset Technical Alliance, and um, that's saving significant sums by... Um, promoting um, joint asset management and um, um, best practice across our roading activities. Um, the shared valuation database service which was its initial um, project that it set up and that's made substantial um, monetary savings. I don't have the, the amount um, to hand at the moment, but over a number of years. Um, at the moment, the uh, Waikato Lass is going through a transformational um, uh, change and they're looking at driving a number of activities which will um, 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 sort of drive the Waikato um, together collectively. Um, the waters, um, um, they're doing work at the moment on the waters and looking at um, setting up a, a cross Waikato um, water asset management and testing regime and um, there's potential savings in that for us. Um, they do a lot of joint procurement 
Um, the most um, um, obvious one for us has been around um, um, the collection of aerial and LIDAR data. Um, they have um, also doing work around um, pulling together a joint building consent cluster. Um, they also, um, Waikato Last um, does a number of services that aren't just for, um, for all council shareholders. And you'll notice on um, your statement of 10, things like they're managing the future proof um, group of councils. So Waikato, Waipa, Hamilton, um, driving significant um, savings there. The, 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 the best information for that is from that um, the, um, the website um, that gives the details of what they, they are achieving. Um, there's um, sometimes it's difficult in shared services to um, demonstrate that there is a um, an economic effect, um, and in some cases is not, but it's really a, a, an increase in service to our sh um, our stakeholders. So um, having joint building consent um, forms and procedures across the whole Waikato um, saves a lot of um, angst and. Um, 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 difficult um, processes for designers, builders when they interact with councils. So now they get a, you know a single um, form to fill in. That's very understandable. Um, and uh, we've done that across our planning um, forms, our building consent forms, etc. Um, in the last couple of years, we did a lot of work around energy management. So we were able to, by working collectively, get um, funding from ECA. Um, to bring in um, expert advisors to look at um, our energy management in our councils and how um, we could make savings um, around um, perhaps um, moving to um, LEDs in certain areas uh, to how we um, manage um, um, our electricity use on various sites. Um, so that's, um, I guess, a brief summary. Um, as I say, the best information is from their, their website. You know, thank you. That's really helpful. I mean, that 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 uh, link to the website, I did get it, but it was from 2018, so I was looking for something a little bit more up to date, which you've given, and that's great. And I know we touched on LASS at our induction, but I just thought it would be good to just have an update that was more specific today. So thanks for that, Langley. I appreciate it. Any more questions, uh, for, uh, Councillor Broad? Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor Toby. Uh, Langley, what, do we have a quantum of what we pay each year towards it and what, uh, as Anne-Marie was alluding to, what was the return we get on it? Uh, do we get a, uh, I, I see you're talking value for money, uh, but do we actually have a measured quantum uh, for each? Yeah, so we don't, we don't get a dividend per se. Um, so uh, we, we pay a, a portion of the... Um, um, I guess the administrative overhead costs, and I think uh, top of my head, it's in the order of about twenty thousand dollars a year. Um, but then you pay for any services that um, you, you subscribe to as a council. Um, so I think overall, that less uh, well, less um, turns over about five million a year. Um, one of those, say so the shared valuation database service, we we buy that service um, from them. Um, and interestingly enough, we actually, the, that's um, our database, we actually sell information from the database collectively, which we're able to do because it hangs under what it less, and that offsets our operating costs. Um, I'd have to go through each different service. So some of them are just joint procurement. So if you look at the Waikato Regional Aerial Photography Service, um, the, the 11 uh, local authorities across the Waikato procure that um, um, collectively. Um, if we were to try and procure that data singularly, um, it would cost us considerably more. But because we don't do that, we haven't got a direct figure to compare against what the savings might be. Um, so we just pay for our share of that service. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, we could... No, that, that does. It just cleared up um, just the information I needed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for, for Langley or Duncan on uh, less? Okay, we'll move on and we'll give Duncan a little bit of a break. He can um, have some time off from uh, reading out reports and uh, Peter, Tom, you're gonna be up next, so uh, brace yourself. So if we move to page 367, uh, Group Manager for Environmental Services, somebody moved to receive a report. 
Thank you, Councillor Ford. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. All those in favour? Against Carrick. Good morning, Peter. Long time no see. And uh, can we congratulate you on um, making sure that you uh, keep your social distancing within your office there. It's um, fantastic to see. Uh, good morning, Your Worship and councillors. Um, so I present to you now the uh, report for planning environmental services for the last month. Um, as you can see, um, COVID-19 level four has hit us. So um, in terms of, as I move through, customer services team, um, they have been at the service centres of Pyra and Waihi manning the phones. Um, we did look at doing that remotely. Also allowing the odd person to come into the centre um, for uh, um, emergencies. Um, keep them going down there. The development, you can see that um, basically there is a slight decrease in the number of building consents and limb activity from uh, last this time last year. Uh, we also realised at this time in terms of development that there's going to be a lot of pressure on um, builders and developers to um, get things moving again. And so we need to um, step up in that space. In terms of um, communications, uh, the comms team has been putting out quite a bit of information uh, in terms of uh, topics on changes to level four for council services, uh, particularly around like rubbish collection, uh, supporting the emergency management of operating center, uh, um, information about wet wipes, dog control, um, we've had some issues there, um, rates, and also supporting the Mayor's video updates, which have been well received. There's an increase in Facebook activity, as you can imagine, and the number of su subscribers has increased. And so we've also increased the number of e-newsletters. So there's quite a bit of work there. And also, of course, with um, the community newspapers not uh, being out there, we've had to um, step up. So but uh, we've done that. In terms of iwi liaison, uh, what we've found is that there's, um, we've had some, um, over the last month, we had some positive uh, engagement with Wellington, uh, with the Department of Internal Affairs in relation to providing um, some, looking at some, a better model of engagement with iwi after treaty settlement. Um, but in recent times, of course, um, our iwi liaison officer has been busy at the Emergency Operating Centre. And what we're finding is that there's a number of um, unemployed iwi in particular who are returning home to Haraki and they are needing some welfare assistance. So our iwi liaison officer has been discussing this with um, local iwi community leaders. As we move on to um, planning and implementation, as I uh, said before, um, in terms of resource consents, we processed the resource consents as much as we could, but we couldn't do site inspections until level three. Uh, we've just commenced that starting yesterday and um, those site inspections are critical for getting those consents out. So um, we're working through that. Um, in terms of the district plan, um, in terms of uh, progressing in particular, our miscellaneous plan change, um, we have seen a slight delay in iwi consultation, as you can well imagine, and it's also causing a few delays um, with our proposed plan changes for Waihe and Pyra, but we're, we're working on those. The Kaimai Wind Farm, um, at this stage we're still awaiting the cultural values assessment, um, hopefully by July this year, and uh, depending on when we get that will depend on when a hearing is likely to be for that. Um, in terms of Terahira Landfall, um, they are intending to lodge a, a consent for a new landfall cell um, within the boundaries of their site, and uh, we're expecting that sometime in the future. Um, in terms of uh, the building team, as you know, we've processed um, consents as much as we could uh, without doing site inspections uh, under level four. Now, um, what's happening is um, now from uh, yesterday, we've started site inspections again. So all those um, building inspections, for instance, that were canceled as a result of the lockdown were um, reinstated. And so they're getting on with those. Um, at this stage, we're not seeing a downturn in the activity just yet. Um, and I think people are busy getting on with the work that was um, deferred from the lockdown. 
Dog control has been quite interesting. Um, basically with level four, um, dog control and noise control has been a, um, a response in terms of um, a deal, deal with it by phone initially. But what happened is as people got out and about in the community and started walking more and more and with their dogs roaming, other dogs were getting off the property and having a go at them. So we increased the number of dog attacks. That's settled down now. And uh, with a few comments on that, including um, the um, strong messages from our mayor and his mirror updates, um, the message is getting out there to community. We are getting a few stock on roads. So he's responding there. In terms of our food businesses, um, the inspections there are being done remotely. And um, we are now aware that businesses are operating, food businesses are operating online if they can um, with contactless um, orders. We are getting our, our lovely, um, one of our other agencies, FENS, the fire, fire and emergency, have, um, as you know, um, uh, let the fire ban uplift the fire ban. Um, but unfortunately, we've had a number of uh, smoke nuisance complaints recently, but that's probably uh, the old Kiwi fashion is if you're on lockdown, you start cleaning up your sections and so have a big burn up. But we are getting a, f a few smoke nuisances because you're not allowed to create a smoke nuisance, particularly in our residential areas. In terms of strategic planning, um, the long-term plan continues, the process continues. However, um, there is a um, deferral um, and a recommendation there in the report for um, the, con the next workshop to be postponed um, to be held in uh, 3rd of June. The Farikawa Coast, um, the Kaiawa project um, is continuing with the community panel there. Um, we had a, our first community panel meeting on the 17th of March and that was well attended. Um, of course, we're now using going online and um, they're hoping to have the next workshop in May. And also there's a lot of information on Council's website about these projects, including this one. Um, our consultation and engagement process for policy and bylaw reviews. Um, there's a recommendation there, but we're covering, as you know, freedom camping, dangerous and sanitary buildings and earthquake prone, etc. That's going to be um, also uh, delayed and there's a recommendation there. And then finally, uh, why he mine, um, there's um, not a lot happening just at the moment, but uh, the mining company is still operating and, but we're not uh, getting any complaints. And uh, unless anybody's got any questions, um, that's my report and the recommendations is on page 367. So we will get to that, uh, Peter. But uh, yes, there are some questions they've been they've been banking up. So uh, I'll first go to uh, Councillor Milner. Thanks, Toby, and um, thanks, Peter. Just regarding the dog attacks, um, normally most dog owners are pretty responsible, so it would seem what's happened is the exception rather than the rule. Um, what's the nature of the attacks and how are the victims been dealt with or is it just a minor sort of things but there's been a lot of them so could you just expand on that a little bit more and what's what's been the result of the people that have been the victim of the attack please yeah the dog the dog attacks have been mainly minor in nature uh, it's basically a dog coming out from a property rushing another dog and maybe trying to have a go um, no we're not aware of anybody actually being Oh, only a couple of people that were threatened. One person, for instance, a dog chased down the road, a guy on a bike, of course the bike was a bit faster. Um, but no, we've, we've um, attended those um, issues and um, spoken to the dog owner concern and if appropriate, and if uh, we felt it was uh, quite blatant then they get an infringement fine, but that's what we've done in that case. But uh, yeah, it's mainly more of a minor nature. And as I say, they are settling down now. Uh, Councillor Smeaton. Peter, on um, page 370 of the agenda, Turahia Landfill, has that, um, uh, what is it, consent application, has that significantly increased the life of the, of the landfill or is it just a kind of a routine consent thing they have to do every now and again? No, that will um, signif significantly increase the life of the landfill. And as I say, at this stage, it's just um, pre-discussions before um, lodgement. So, yeah, thank you. Just for clarity, uh, Councillor Smeaton, um, it's a, um, on the greater site, but a complete new landfill cell. So it's quite a major development. 
Councillor Broad. Uh, thanks, uh, Mayor Toby. Um, the Forikawa Coast name change. Um, at a previous council meeting, uh, mm. there was a discussion about when that name was going to be changed from Kaiawa Coast. Um, I believe that at the time the decision was that it would be uh, consulted with the uh, public in, in Kaiawa, and if they supported it, that the name change will go through. I haven't seen any um, information uh, responding to that. I've had discussions with a couple of people in Kaiawa and they're not uh, pleased at the name change. Um, so for me personally, I'm not happy to support that um, until I have some evidence that uh, the consultation was done. And further to that, Forakawa um, River, Forakawa Estuary, Forakawa Harbour and Forakawa Coast is an area that is already allocated between uh, a poke tree and Onimana on the eastern seaboard. So I want to make sure we, one, don't have a conflict of name and two, that uh, the local residents have been consulted on the, the, the name change as we originally agreed. So we could, and if you check back on your emails, Councillor Broad, you'll see that that um, was made, it was sent out to everyone. So you did make a, um, a comment at a council meeting. We went to the community panel, who is the representatives of the community put forward and it was put to them and they emphatically said, yes, we're happy for it to be um, uh, renamed and called the Farikawa Coast, because that was more appropriate for what the work we were trying to do. After that uh, meeting, which we had, uh, an email was sent out to all the councillors to um, make them aware of that change. Um, thanks, Toby. Um, Mayor Toby. Yes, I understand there was a meeting with that, um, that panel. That was the panel that originally suggested the name, so they were never going to suggest no, anything else. No, 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 no. So the panel that are, uh, there's two panels, there's a community panel, and then there's the panel um, made up um, with other members. So it was the other, it wasn't the community panel that made up the, or put forward the name change. It was a the different committee um, that put the name change forward, which has myself, Councillor Harris and Councillor Spicer on that panel. And it was taken to the first meeting of the community panel, which is chaired by um, Justin Johnson, um, and it was that panel that um, was asked about the name change and uh, they, they agreed to have the name changed. Uh, if the council support that then that's what it is. As I said, I'm, I'm not, not happy. Councillor Gentle. You just need to unmute your microphone there, Councillor Gentle. Push the buttons and they don't work. Uh, okay, I'll blame the blame the computer. Um, through me, Toby, Peter, just uh, three questions in regard to page 370. The Te Ohira landfill was one that um, Duncan did ask part of. I was going to ask how long that would extend the life for rather than would it extend the life? How long would it extend the life? And after that, where to? Is there sort of a, a plan B in place? B, or question two, the regulatory services building consents applications, 13 new dwellings, that was obviously prior to COVID-19. Uh, did any of those pull out or and has, has things picked up or died away since uh, coronavirus? And third, the long-term planning. Uh, I personally think, and I think it's in place, but we need more input from the public, obviously, that the mindset's gone from thinking about annual plans, long-term plans, to um, what's for dinner tonight, um, now that we can get takeaways. Right, I'll respond to them in reverse order. So in terms of the long-term plan, yes, you are correct, and there'll be more consultation on that in the near future, and you'll be advised accordingly about that. In terms of uh, the terror here, oh, sorry, in terms of um, uh, building consents, no, no one's pulled out of those dwellings at this point in time, um, so that's still continuing. Um, and in terms of the terror here at Landfall, um, I haven't been party to the discussions, but I can find that information out for you and, um, and get that to you after the meeting. Thank you, Peter. It's not a major, I just thought, you know, is it going to extend the life for one year, 10 years or 50 years? So perhaps um, I could answer that. So the proposal is to extend the life um, currently based on waste volumes. I think they've got about five years life. Uh, the proposal would extend the life out to about 2032 to 2035. So about 
about 12 to 15 years, perhaps. Thanks, Langley. Any further questions for Peter on his report? Councillor Daly. Sorry, you, Mayor Toby, for Peter. Um, the checks that are being done online now for the food premises, um, did I understand that correct, that they're being um, light renewals or new ones um, are being applied for online? And if that is the case, is there going to be physical checks still done um, on the pre on premises? Currently, um, the checks are being, in terms of how we approach that um, under COVID, is being done remotely. That's been uh, advised to us by the Ministry of Primary Industries, and it's mainly looking at their food control plans and how they maintain that food is safe. So there's no physical checks at the moment possibly under level two that may move into phys physical checks. So, um, and that's really uh, accommodating those food premises uh, that are making changes to their um, process, particularly to accommodate online deliveries and contactless um, deliveries at the moment. It's, it's not um, doing um, new, uh, new premises at this point in time. It's just that um, I think, I believe that um, everybody should be checked physically, the premises should be checked physically. I agree with as much online as um, is practicable, especially with what's gone on. But at the end of it, I believe every premises should be checked physically. And, and we concur with that and that will be done, but just at the moment, um, it's being done remotely and under the guidance of the Ministry of Primary Industries who basically, um, dictate as to how we um, deal with this, um, deliver that service. Thanks, Peter. Okay. Any further questions for, for Peter? Oh, sorry, Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Uh, just going backwards a step as I do occasionally, I, I just wish to endorse um, Mayor Toby's comments uh, surrounding the the renaming of uh, the Kaiawa 2120 to Whare Kaua 2120. I'm a member of both committees, the Joint Working Party and the Community Working Party, and the, the, I believe that the process that was followed was robust and was fit for purpose. Um, so I do endorse uh, uh, what uh, Mayor Toby has suggested. The other comment I would like to make is uh, I believe that we as a council should record our thanks uh, to our comms team for the work that they've done over the last six weeks. I know there's still a lot of work to be done with COVID-19 and communication, but I do believe that, um, that, that they've done a magnificent job and commend uh, Mayor Toby for the work that he's been doing uh, within our community. And as, as Toby bubbles, um, I look forward to uh, uh, listening to each day. So I would like it recorded um, that we uh, uh, pass on our thanks and congratulations to our comms team. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Councillor Harris Ross. That was uh, yeah, I was going to say that, and that's that's awesome. Our communications team has been working um, tirelessly throughout this process, and along with all councillors, uh, everyone's done an amazing job in uh, sharing the information and getting the information out there. And with the Fotikoa Coast, I mean, we just got to remember it's just a document name. It's not a not a name change of any townships, Kiowa is still Kiowa. Um, nothing, nothing else changes in that regards. It's just the, the name of the document, which incorporates a coastline, um, which covers multiple areas, not just, not just Kiowa township itself. So if there's no further, oh, sorry, Councillor Garrett, sorry, Rodney. Oh, oh. oh that's all right, we'll... Uh... Um, I've just got to apologize. I've got a few issues um, work-wise. I just need to get out of here for 10 minutes, my apologies. No worries, we're just about to, I was just going to call um, before we, if you just hang around, we'll just move these recommendations if you like. Yeah, We okay. just go back to page 367. There's uh, yeah, three yeah, recommendations. Toby, I, I noticed Ray's got his hand up. I don't know if that's a, a hangover from a previous question. Oh, no, sorry, I didn't see that. Have you got a question, Councillor Broad? Uh, thanks, Mayor Toby. No, that was uh, the previous question. I understand um, what Ross.
Awesome. So we'll just go back to page 367, uh, the three recommendations. Could I have a mover for, for the recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Tilsley. Thank you, Councillor Smeaton. All those in favour? Against? Carried. So, uh, Councillor Garrett, if you, uh, we're going to break for a quick cup of tea. So, all, all those in here and all those out there watching, we're going to break for approximately 10 minutes. And that'll hopefully give um, Councillor Rodney Garrett some time to deal with his issues uh, for everybody to vacate and grab a cup of tea, freshen up, and uh, we'll be back. So, um, yep, well done. Time. Cheers. So, so Mayor Toby, uh, we're just so that the public know the exact time. So, at um, 10.25, we will reschedule. Yes, yep, we'll go for 10.25. That gives us 13 minutes.
Does this change my auto as a as a better microphone? Got to say, uh, working from home has its benefits. The coffee's definitely better. Got Makona. I was going to say, I like the choice of um, cup you got there too, uh, Toby. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. I'm back. I'm back now. It's going to start me up. Yep, no worries. So we are still uh, portraying out there live to the world. So don't forget your best behaviour. Best behaviour. Eh? I'm back. You can hitch, hitch me up. Okay. Attention, this is not a COVID announcement, but uh, you guys are live, just letting you know. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, we're well aware. We're well aware. But nothing changes. This is how we'd normally uh, meander back into the chambers after our cup of coffees. Um, but we finally uh, have got better coffee with the Makona. Okay, and it has just gone uh, 10.25, so we'll uh, reopen the meeting. And if everybody goes to page 376 of their agenda, and the uh, topic of dogs is hot on today. Deputy Mayor Milner, are you happy to receive the report? Thank you. Could I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Buckthorpe. All those in favour? Against carried. Peter. Thank you, Worship and Councillors. So uh, this is a report presenting the dog registration fees for the coming year. As you know, the current year expires on the 30th of June, and we are required by law to get Council to have a resolution with those dog fees. Um, in line with um, Council's uh, wishes to keep um, fees um, consistent at the moment and no increases, um, basically, this re report presents to you that um, for the coming 2020-21 year, 
that the uh, dog fees and charges as outlined in the appendix schedule one of the report remain the same as they are currently. And that's the basis of this report. Questions? I have a mover, Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer is happy to move, Councillor Buckdorf is happy to second the first questions before I put it to the vote. All those in favour? Gains carried. Thank you. That was a quick one. <laughs> okay, now we have, if we move on to page 381, I'll move that we receive the report. Could I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Broad, on the adoption of the draft development contributions policy 2020. Adrian, would you like to take us through this? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, as you're aware, we've had several um, uh, council workshops on the adoption of a development contributions policy. Um, and so I'll just take you through this report um, and uh, for council to consider whether we reintroduce a development contributions policy or not. I would just like to acknowledge also the staff that have spent quite a lot of time working on this report. It, it has been a, quite a big task to put it together. And also the consultant, Rob Bates, um, who has given us a reduction of his fees um, as a result of COVID. He's indicated that he would reduce his fees to acknowledge that. Um, I'll take you through the report. So on, if we can just move to um, page 382, the background. Um, we have historically had a development contributions policy, but on the 1st of July 2015, the council resolved um, not to have a policy in place. The council is now subsequently, um, we've had a lot more development than we were having at that stage, and um, the council is now um, being asked to reconsider as to whether we reintroduce uh, development contributions. On uh, page 383, um, there's just a key summary of uh, the elements of the draft uh, contributions policy um, and I'd just like to highlight a few of those points. Um, the draft policy seeks to uh, get development contributions from um, most of our infrastructure activities which include transport, water, wastewater, stormwater, um, inf community infrastructure and solid waste. At this stage, um, there's no business, um, industrial and industry uh, development contributions for community infrastructure or solid waste. Um, we will review that when we um, reconsider the development contribution policy for next uh, LTP cycle. We also haven't identified any development contributions for land drainage. And the reason being for that is, is that we um, none of the work there has um, a bearing on um, growth at this stage. <clears throat> um, we've had to develop um, different geographical areas in accordance with the code or catchment areas um, in accordance with the Local Government Act. And we have uh, some of those being district wide, um, primarily land transport and solid waste. Um, and one or two for water and wastewater, but generally for the more localized assets such as water, wastewater and storm stormwater, the catchment is based to, is, is restricted to the area that the suppliers um, for. So for example, any development contributions um, around for the plains for water, the catchment is the plains area um, and all of the people who benefit from that catchment. <clears throat> um, the policy does include expenditure on uh, historic capital work um, that has been done and it identifies what spare capacity there is and that capacity is available obviously for development. It must be noted that this development contributions uh, draft policy is for a period of eight years, so the last eight years of the current long-term plan cycle. Usually it's a 10-year cycle, but we will revise that in, uh, for the 2021 policy review. Um, the, moving on from the um, page 384, 
um, just some options that could be looked at. Um, the council um, has indicated that they'd pref their preference is to reintroduce a policy by 1 July 2020. The alternative would be is that we could reintroduce it next year in 2021. Um, however, that does affect our ability to um, get uh, contributions from uh, developers in between now and then in some way we can use financial contributions. However, it does um, those address a slightly different um, take. Um, the engaging with our communities, um, you would have seen that there was a, a consultation document attached to the council agenda that went out. Um, and so we will seek if the council is wanting to reintroduce uh, policy, uh, the policy, we will seek feedback from the 1st of May to the 25th of May. Um, we have a targeted stakeholder meeting on the 15th of May, um, and I'm going to have that as a Zoom, and the focus of that will primarily be uh, for developers and will be around determining the units of demand, um, which causes the biggest um, confusion in the policy. I'll give an overview of the policy, how's that, how that is prepared, um, but then uh, spend some time working through the units of demand, because the units of demand determine the, the size of the policy. Um, section 5 considers the various options available to the council and discusses the pros and cons of those um, and then section 6 just um, indicates that at this stage um, of writing of this report um, council the staff didn't have a recommended option um, as the uh, council workshop was held um, subsequent to the preparation of this report um, before I um, complete the feedback on the report, if, we, if you could go to the uh, draft development contributions policy document that was circulated um, and go to um, table two, which is located on page 10 of the draft policy, uh, table one, um, you will see the schedule of development contributions that are payable and what makes up each of those individual uh, contributions. Um, <clears throat> so generally the development contributions range from approximately two and a half thousand for Kiowa up to about nine and a half for Paru and 10,000 uh, 10, maybe for Kirapehi um, and it identifies the various um, contributors to that. Moving back to the report, um, the going back up to um, the recommendations that are on, on page 381 and 382. Um, I'll pass on back to your worship. Questions or comments? Um, I, I just thank everyone. I mean, the workshop we went right through this um, this policy and looked at all the options. Um, so, so we have certainly spent a lot of time on it, but if there are any, any further uh, questions or points of clarification before we before we go into it too much further, Councillor Broad. Thanks, Mayor Toby. Um, just want to point out that, yeah, well, the timing mightn't seem ideal for reintroducing this. Uh, it's something that as a council we've been working on for a while um, to redo it and just to reassure uh, people the reasoning behind it. It's to take the pressure off the current ratepayers um, for infrastructure costs and going forward that when capacity is taken up in various infrastructure, it means all the ratepayers then share the cost uh, for improving it. In this case, what we're doing is um, saying that if you want to develop or increase or subdivide, um, you pay a share towards that um, capacity that you're now using and taking up. So it, it makes it fairer uh, for development and it makes fairer for existing ratepayers that they're not uh, subsidising um, to a certain degree um, developments that come along, but um, everyone sort of inputs uh, equally. So uh, I support that we've got to drive this forward and with public consultation, we'll get more guidance. Thank you. Any other questions?
Yeah, and, and thank you, uh, Councillor Broad. I mean, the timing is, um, some would say that it's wrong, some would say that it's uh, absolutely perfect timing. So um, uh, at present, our ratepayers have got enough of a burden um, just with our current infrastructure costs, let alone adding any more to those. So um, if you look at those tables, table one and table two that Adrian was referring to and the, the variations between um, the, the Kiowa to Paiwa, the 2000 to 9,000, I mean, the development contributions aren't huge in comparison to some of our um, more immediate neighbours as far as um, development contributions go. Um, but it does just help spread that cost and spread that cost a little bit more evenly um, across across them and, and the whole, whole district. So I'm certainly happy for it to, to move forward and I'll move the recommendations. And could I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, and I had multiple people putting their hand up for that. So uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Those against. Well done, Councillor Harris, for putting your hand down quickly. So that's the recommendations on page 381. And that we go for um, 2020, not 2021. Thank you, councillor. So we'll move on now to page 389, community initiatives report. Uh, councillor Tilsey, happy to move that we receive the report. Thank you. And thank you, councillor Anderson. All those in favour? Against carried. David Varco. Can I just comment that uh, you look much better without your moustache than you did with your moustache? Good morning, Your Worship Mayor. Thank you for that uh, uh, that um, comment. It was an interesting uh, an interesting process. Uh, good morning, Councillors. Um, to follow is the community initiatives report. Um, Going down through it, we'll be looking at the uh, the grants and donations. Um, as you can see, the Plains Ward Community Assistance Fund has had some grants taken out of it. Um, I'll just look at the unallocated amounts. So there's three, six, um, and eighty there. Uh, Pyro Ward Community Assistance Fund uh, unallocated is eleven thousand, and then why he. Assistance fund alloc unallocated there is six thousand. Um, district fund is is over budget at present, um, and then we're looking at the significant natural areas and heritage features fund. Um, that's fifty five unallocated. Um, Plains Community Recreation Facility Development Fund. Um, uh, we're um, balance there of one fifty nine. And then the Pyro Community uh, Recreation Facilities Development Fund balance of 136. And then the Waihi uh, balance of 523. Uh, those, those funds are um, the old name for the, um, for the um, community um, development contribution. So they th theoretically are for bricks and mortar that support community um, initiatives. Um, looking at further down the uh, district community projects assistant uh, balance here is 51,000 and the uh, district social strategy fund uh, unallocated 68,000. Um, we have had requests for some financial uh, assistant that will follow that's from the Thames Valley Hockey Turf Association. Uh, the social initiatives, there was a meeting on the 11th of March. Um, the following activities are identified for the action for this term. Uh, following up on the sister cities, of course, with COVID-19, the uh, planned exchange for August and October has been cancelled this year. Uh, and the relationships uh, will continue to maintain with a review of the 220 exchange program occurring in January 2021. Um, uh, and 
also just on there was the uh, the cancellation of Anzac Day, unfortunately due to COVID-19 response. Uh, I dare say that, uh, that where the street that I am was on, uh, we did have we did have quite a few um, down at the uh, down at the letterbox, including a 94 year old living next door with his medals on. So quite impressive. Um, the Thames Valley uh, on page uh, page three nine six, the Thames Valley Hockey Turf Association has requested for some financial assistance. Um, they've asked for twenty thousand to come out of the Plains Community Recreation Facilities Development Fund. Um, the purpose of the uh, the recommend uh, of the asking for funds is for the installation to help for the installation of LED lights on their playing fields. Um, they have sought funding uh, and have received a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, they have a balance of 51,975. They're requesting a grant from HDC uh, to go towards the 51,975 and they will be able to pay the, the balance within their operating. Um, it's a facility that is used by up to 500 players per week. Uh, in peak conditions, they can be up to 800 players per week. So it does... Uh, definitely align with the Community Recreation Facilities Development Fund um, guidelines. Um, the, the options that are being put in place is, is decline the request. Uh, option two is grant the 20,000. Um, the recommendations of the of the report uh, to um, uh, to accept the, the grant of twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, we haven't quite got into that report yet, uh, David. That's the the next item. So we'll just we'll just get questions on your first report, and then we'll we'll get into that report. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, on page, uh, the bottom of page 392, I might have asked this question before, but, um, well, sorry, it might be, sorry, bottom of page 391, significant natural areas. I've, I think I've uh, commented before about um, doing up the wetland area around Lake Gilmore and Waihe. And um, so it looks to me like the money is available for that kind of project. Is that correct, David or Toby? The, the, um... I wonder if I could respond to that, uh, Councillor Smeaton. So the, uh, the SNA fund was set up when we um, put in place the SN, SNAs um, um, through the district plan. So it was to deal with those issues, not to do with non... So while it's a, a natural area, that's sort of a council reserve. So it's for SNAs on private property where we've lifted the, the status, we've, we've um, put in place a, a, an impediment on land use. And um, if someone wants to fence those um, or, oh, yeah. or develop them, it's available for those on private land. Um, I don't think there was any intent that we would um, put it towards public works on public land. Can I just take that a bit further then? Um, are any of those other funds in this section of the agenda um, suitable for the likes of that project to apply to? Uh, you award discretionary fund. Um, there, there, are, there are a few funds that you could could use to, to, to purpose that, repurpose that money. Um, there's also uh, Waikato Regional Council has funds um, for some of that kind of stuff. So. There's plenty of options, certainly out there. Thank you. No worries. I just have a question on page uh, 390. I made a, made a note. Uh, the Ketapehi Marae, the Kotawai project, there's still that $500 sitting in there and that, that money didn't actually get spent and has been asked to be pulled out of that report and the, the, the tally should reflect that. So can we get that um, removed and so that they know that there is... Uh, spare $500 that they can use um, and I'm sure 
the wards with their um, discretionary funds are going to be using them for all sorts of projects coming up to, to help their respective communities um, throughout this COVID process. Is there any other further questions for David Barco on that report? Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer. Uh, not a question, more a comment, just an update on social initiatives. Um, at our working party, we also discussed the Elephant in the Paddock initiative, uh, which is something the Plains Ward drove with Jill Leonard a few years ago, and it was very successful. It provided support, uh, information on support for mental health for our farming community. Uh, we've identified quite recently that that's something we really need to push out. So um, it's not on this table, but Katie McLaren is going to be doing some work on that this week and we'll bring that to our social initiatives working party for discussion soon. I think we need to get something out there pretty quickly. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Um, the, the COVID has sort of overshadowed our um, farming community, the agricultural sector of our communities that we are in. Um, I think it's the worst drought conditions recorded. Um, is, would that be right, Duncan? Um, and while you look outside and there's some uh, green grass, um, that doesn't mean we're not in a drought. It's, a, it's what's called a green drought. So our farming community, our farming sector is, is certainly hurting just as much as everybody else. And we, we got to remember that. And I think it's uh, very appropriate to have one of those events going forward. And that's something that we can work on now. So we'll, we'll get that ball rolling. Awesome. That's, that's great. Any, Councillor Gentle, you had a question? And then I'll come to you, Councillor Smeaton. Okay, yes, thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, uh, through you, David, a couple of questions. The Community Initiatives Report, I think at a meeting prior, I sort of mentioned that some of these things have been, the money's gone out, others hasn't. Was there any way that we could decipher or maybe put an asterisk or separate somehow what's new, if there's anything new that's come in for this meeting as compared to others? I'm just wondering whether we could get that actioned. And page 395, Creative New Zealand, I don't know who wants to answer this one, the Creative Community Schemes, eight applications were received. Who, what, how much, and how the assessments, um, how, the, how does the committee choose those and, and sort out the assessments? So that's just a point for you, David, to take back to, to staff. And I think Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer would be the best one to answer about the Creative Waikato. So we have very rigid criteria that we have to work from and that's set nationally. Um, and uh, from memory, the applications we had this time round were uh, pottery, a couple of pottery. Uh, one was a workshop, a couple were workshops, uh, a performance. They, they vary. It's, it's generally murals, performances, uh, some support for our Wahi Drama Society. Uh, they've got an initiative coming up. Um, it varies e each round. Uh, what was disappointing with this round is that we didn't use all the funding. Um, and as much as we tried to get that information out to the community and encourage people to apply, um, we unfortunately didn't get enough applications this time round. So that's something we've got to work on for our next round, which is in six months time. But I'm, I'm happy to send you those applications if you want, Brian. I'll unmute mute myself. Yeah, sorry, no, I appreciate that. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, I just don't know too much about the background, which is probably what the public is saying the same. Um, who can apply, what's it for? Are there uh, maximum amounts? Can people apply once, twice? Do they come back to you annually? Um, just those sorts of things might be good to clear up. Yeah, so people do apply regularly and there aren't uh, limits. Usually grants are for about one to $2,000, but it, it varies. They're small grants. Um, uh, and we do put publicity out there. Our comms team is very good at doing that. We just don't seem to get that reach out there. So maybe, maybe we need to be a bit more, more creative in that space, I'm not sure. But happy to share all that information with you, Brian, absolutely. And with everybody else, if you're interested. Thank you. Councillor Harris. Uh, thank you, Mayor Toby. Uh, my comments were related to, to the next report uh, that David moved on to. So I'll, I'll um, uh, right. wait until that report comes up. No worries. Councillor Backthorpe, was your question for this report or the next report? Yeah, thanks, Mayor Toby. I was, no, I was just going to comment regarding Anne Marie's comments on the elephant in the paddock, paddock and your comments regarding the, the drought. It is a significant drought. I don't think people can underestimate just how hard it is at the moment because we haven't had any significant rain 
for nearly four and a half months. So that in itself would just about be a record and um, feed supplies are, are very, very, uh, very, very hard to, to buy in at the moment. Uh, the cost of feed's really expensive and um, and most people have had to dry their cows off early. So there's, there's no cash flow basically coming in from May or very little through from May to uh, next calving. So um, yeah, the, the pain's gonna start hitting around the middle of winter. So uh, that that project would be, uh, really needs to get off the ground. So if Katie needs any assistance with it, I'm happy to um, to help and we can work in, in line with um, with the Farmers Trust uh, to, get to get the right outcome. Cheers. Thanks a lot, um, that's, that's great. Councillor Smeaton, did you have a, another question or another? No, I was just uh, pleased that the commentary had come out about the drought. So uh, most of what has needed to be said has been said. And I've sent an email to a few people as well, which you might not have seen yet, which takes it a little bit further. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for um, discussing it. No, no worries. So any further questions for David on the community initiatives report? If not, we'll move on to, to the next report because there seems to be a, a few questions on that. So if we just move on to page 396. Somebody move that we receive the report. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor Tilsley. All those in favour? Against carried. David, now you can uh, elaborate more on the uh, Thames Valley hockey too. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a facility that has, it's as aging, it does have older lights. Um, the new LED lights that have been sought um, do have a, an extra long life. Um, they do have a less operating cost to them. Um, so it is, a, it is a great direction by Thames Valley Hockey um, Turf Association to implement these. Uh, at the same time, it allows for a clear light for the players, so they don't have to worry about health and safety issues of tripping over on the turf. Um, so as I've said, they have asked for $20,000 um, from Hauraki District Council, and that will be coming out of the uh, Recreation Facilities Development Fund should you uh, approve the recommendation. Do you have any questions about that? Probably not so many questions. Councillor Ross Harris as the Plains Ward Chair. Did you want to speak to the report? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, yeah, the, the Plains Ward have been through this uh, uh, report and recommendation. We are in total support of um, the, the application. Um, I must um, express our, the, the ward's thanks to, to both Katie and to, to John MacGyver for putting such a, a comprehensive report together. It's um, certainly covered the options. Um, and uh, I would, uh, I believe that we've got Philip Buckthorpe wanting to, to move the resolution and I would second that resolution. So we have a mover and a seconder. Before I put to the vote, is there any questions or points of clarification that anyone requires? Councillor Milner. Uh, not so much clarification, just um, I know it didn't fit exactly with what the fund um, guidelines are, but really when you look at it, it, it is um, a new piece of infrastructure and to me it fits perfectly. It's a well-used facility, the community supports it and it's not just NAT here, it's right across the district and, and from further afield outside the district. It's a sub-regional facility. To me, it's, it's well deserving of this funding and I fully support the resolution. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Paul. Brian, Councillor Gentle, did you have a question? He probably does and when he's unfrozen and comes back from Samoa, we'll get back to him. Councillor Broad, did you have a question? Uh, thanks, Mayor Toby. Yeah, just <clears throat> backing up with uh, Ross has just said, um, 
the lights that were installed were in 1992. They're pretty well past their use-by date and to a point where they uh, turn off and on um, during night games, which has become to become a dangerous situation for players that are trying to participate. And um, if we're looking to make things localised and keep players in our district, which isn't just Nati, but the whole Haraki district, it takes in Tiara Thames. They play, it's um, something that we need to upgrade. It's a facility that the council actually own um, and, the, and the lands the council owns. So um, I think it just improves our facilities. And if you look at 20 something years, that the old lights went for, it's um, a small amount to pay to keep a community situation safe. So um, I'm happy to support this as well. Councillor Gentle, have you come back or are you still a bit frozen there? He might be, he might be gone. We might have to, um, apologies. So I'll, I'll have to put it to the vote without uh, Councillor Brian Gentle's question, unfortunately. He's, He's gone into loss mode. So uh, we've had it moved by Councillor Buckthorpe. We've had it seconded by Councillor Harris. All those in favour, please say aye. Any against? Carried. Hopefully Brian can get back in at some point. So page 403, Community Recreation Monthly Report. Councillor Wilkinson, are you happy to move that or receive the report? We'll say, are you there, Councillor Wilkinson? Yep, he's happy to move that we receive the report. Can we have a seconder? Thank you, to, <laughs> thank you, Joe. Councillor Tilsley, all those in favour, please say aye. Yeah, it's carried. Hopefully it's not my mic playing up that's causing all this to, to, to no, that's great. So David, you, you're back. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this report is the Community Recreations Monthly Report for April 2020. Uh, goes down through our recreation and also includes libraries. Um, the COVID-19 has um, definitely thrown some challenges at us with the closing of all the facilities. Um, going through the positive sides of the libraries is that our online services um, have increased uh, are shown in the uh, in the graph on page 406 for March um, and it is anticipated that those digital uh, online memberships will will increase with the April reporting. Uh, the district um, swimming pools have closed. Uh, we had a good season. Um, Nati you will see was down uh, a couple of hundred and that's probably due to the fact that the uh, season was late in opening with the repainting of that pool, um, good good attendance in Pyro, um, up, up a thousand, which is great to see, and also schools being up, um, and then why he also um, uses being up. Um, so it was a it was a good season for the for the swimming. I think the the summer weather probably had something to do with that. Um, going through the projects. Um, the district libraries, uh, the book budget, uh, they, those um, purchases are continuing. Um, there has been some chat around that with that expenditure, but of course with COVID-19 and people getting out and about, um, when we drop back down to level two, uh, there will be a need for the uh, libraries to have new, new material for, for people to, to look at. Um, Karinga Hackey uh, Reserve Development, um, where the staff are still seeking alternatives on a toilet for the hall there. Uh, Wharf Street, uh, Turu Walkway, um, those will be those projects will be getting back underway with the uh, with the end of COVID, and we were lucky to get the decorative lights put in place uh, just before lockdown. So that project is completed. Victoria Park um, playground upgrade. Uh, we'll be talking to the supplier of the Flying Fox there to see how they were pre-COVID. Um, that material, that, that equipment was sitting in China. 
and was due for uh, shipment to New Zealand. So we'll find out where that is, along with the poor, poured surface for Gilmore um, Park Playground. The pyro domain entrance, the service entrance has been completed um, and the pedestrian entrance will go along with the, uh, with the Wharf Street upgrade. Um, there's a, a report attached from Sport Waikato, which we'll go through. Um, but due to um, just, a, just a, a basis on the recreation activities, um, of course, with COVID lock, lockdown, um, all parks were closed. We did leave some toilets has been, has been talked about previously open. They were mainly on the um, State Highway 2. Uh, playgrounds were closed, libraries were closed, um, pretty much all our recreating areas were closed, um, apart from those that were getting out to um, actively recreate uh, in their bubble locations, walking through the parks. Um, I can say that I've never seen so many people using the parks in Cambridge where I live, um, so it's whilst it has been a shock to the system, I think it might have a silver lining that people are actually getting out and about and using our facilities. Does anybody have any questions on the report? Councillor Daly. I'd just like to query the um, lighting and the trees in the Pyro Main Street and the overspend or looks like an overspend for it um, are they just for the trees in the park or are they for um, trees in the main street as well or because if the budget was fifteen thousand and we spent nine and a half um, am i reading it right Yes, yes, that's correct. So they were the lighting that were in the Canary Palms opposite the um, opposite um, Council Milner's uh, petrol station. The reason for that over over the, the um, overspend there is due to the road going through Pyro is a level two road, um, and it required a, a more expensive traffic management plan. To get that project completed, so that's what the overexpend. That's what the overspend is. Because it's uh, quite significant on um, that increase is quite significant. Maybe um, we need to reconsider um, something like that. Um, I I think it's been a, a good outcome. It um, has achieved what we were hoping to achieve. I think. But when we're doing something like this, that is a big overspend just for traffic management. And I think we need to be more aware of it before, of that type of thing, before we actually agree to do it in the future. It's probably something that needs to be re-looked at through your annual plan process. So that, that 15,000 was in the long-term plan for, um, and it's been around for, I'd want to say six or seven years nearly, that $15,000 um, for, for lighting. And the project's been approved and then we came up with some plans on what to go forward. And then if you remember, um, there was the incident at, at Matata where some uh, road workers um, tragically lost their lives. So uh, the, the safety precautions put on um, all um, traffic management plans is, has been greater. And so those costs have incurred and it's just, something that uh, hasn't been um, pushed through into those projects to make sure. So it would have been, have to have been cancelled altogether or uh, re-looked at. So very much uh, point noted, um, Councillor Daly will um, certainly need to have a look through those just to make sure that those costs are certainly true. That's the unfortunate part of the 10 year plan. Any Deputy Mayor Milner? Yeah, just a follow up on that one, um, please David and thanks Toby. Um, some of those, just as a note, some of those will need a little bit of attending to and, and a bit of follow-up maintenance because they're starting to sort of move a wee bit, but that's probably just teething problems. But with regards to the budget, how much of the traffic management cost is shared 
with the uh, general maintenance of the trees because there's a lot of trimming of trees goes on and that's every year or two anyway. And then I know the lighting did piggyback off that project. So the traffic management mostly was going to happen anyway, but perhaps the cones and what have you stayed out for another day or two longer. So was there a share and what share went towards this project versus the regular maintenance please? Uh, through you, Mayor Toby, um, Councillor Milner, uh, that was a, a shared cost. You're, you're correct, and the Canariensis were uh, were pruned at the same time as the lights were were put through. Um, unfortunately, I don't I don't have a breakdown with me, but can provide that for you at a later time. Any further questions for for David on the report? Yeah, one from me, Mayor Toby. Yep. Through you, through you, Toby. David, just going back to the Karangahaki um, toilet structure, we were told pre-COVID-19 that um, that particular entity that were putting the toilets together in um, inside containers, uh, and this this reflects also for the terminus at Kaiawa because we were putting a similar one there. We were told that. Uh, there was follow-up going on with a similar similar type of product through a different entity and uh, that we would uh, get get some sort of information back from that but um, you, you've talked about that you're following up on something can you give us some time frames and and what are we looking at here because this Karanga hacky toilet's been going on for a long time and I think a lot of people want to see it in Uh, through you, Mayor Toby, uh, Councillor Buckthorn, um, thank you for that. Um, yes, the project management office is looking at alternatives. The um, One of the reasons why we're taking a, bit, a little, little bit of time, the container toilets were sitting around $45,000, and that was for three, three to four pans. Um, on some comparisons that we've looked at, um, we're looking at anything from 90 through to $160,000 just for two pans. Um, so we want to uh, make sure that we can um, find a, a, a good solution for that going forward. Uh, but we will let you know as soon as we do. Yeah, perhaps maybe that was why the uh, first entity um didn't carry on because they couldn't do it for that price. Uh, um, mm. Through you, Mayor, through you, Mayor Toby, um, the container toilet was done with um, irrigation PVC and 12 volt um, systems. Um, what was found to be the problem was that the irrigation system did not um, provide enough water for the for the usage of the toilet. In other words, the valves were uh, weren't adequate to, to for that system. No further questions and also uh, in the appendix there is an update from the um, sports coordinators from um, from your sports coordinator. So moving on to page 418, a subject we've been long awaiting for um, there has been an enormous amount of emails. Uh, Councillor Anne Marie Spicer is clapping her hands. Uh, the Gilmore Lake Silt and Weed Control, for the radio controlled sailboat course. So, page 418. Um, Anne Marie, I'm going to ask that you receive this report. Thank you. And, we're, and Councillor Wilkinson, are you happy to second that we receive the report? Thank you. All those in favour? Against carried. Back to you, David. Thank you, Worship Me, Toby and councillors. Uh, this report is about Gilmore Lake silt and weed control of the radio controlled sailboat race course. Um, the recommendation is in front of you um, in regards to a options of hand weeding, water level manipulation and aquatic herbicide application just to the radio sailboat course. Um, considerable um, Research has been done into the lake as it is a multifunctional lake. Uh, it provides a retention service for water coming off a street. It provides a wetland for cleaning water and releasing it back into the Onahinamuri. 
and it also is a uh, ecosystem for our wildlife and native fish. So putting all those together, considerable um, work was done to to try and find a solution that would that would um, make all users happy, um, including including the radio control sailboat systems. Um, years, of years of research, David. Years of research. <laughs> yes, we've got to get we've got to get it right. <laughs> Um, so in, in, in front of you, the, the options that we've been put forward is leave the lake as is, um, as a wildlife and native fish sanctuary, and unfortunately not support the uh, radio control boat enthusiasts. Hand weeding, while it's labour intensive, it can be um, specifically identified to an area that needs to be done. Uh, we've got shading and bottom lining, uh, that's pretty much putting a tarp over it. And letting it uh, and letting it letting it drown. Um, we've got the Chinese carp. Uh, then we've got mechanical long reach arm diggers, and mechanical weed harvesting, which is which is a different to the to the long reach. It's actually um, like a, a harvester in, in agriculture. And then we've got the um, suction dredging, which is taking out uh, all the all the dredge from the bottom. And then your application of uh, herbicide and aquatic herbicide, and my favourite, of course, is the black swan introduction. Um, <laughs> the, um, the there's budget um, implications for either of those options. Um, talking to the professionals in the field, that here they they've, they've shared their recommendation of an integrated control. So not one is going to is going to achieve what we want with that multifunctional space. Um, so they've looked at the the aquatic herbicide along with um, along with the dropping of the water level, and then if need be a manual a manual weed. Um, so the recommendation that, that we're putting forward to council is those three, those three options, and uh, they will be um, completed using um, using operational funds. So there will no, not be a request for additional funding to achieve this. Um, are there any questions about the report? I tried to share a picture of two lovely looking black swans um, to paint, paint a different picture, uh, <laughs> but I couldn't do it, someone had stolen that. So Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer, I'm sure you would uh, love to speak to this. Um, yes, this report has been a long time coming and I wish past war chair Max McLean was here today at this historic event. Um, David, I want to thank you for the huge amount of work you've put into this report. It is well researched and I've spent a bit of time looking into the options and I agree with your recommendation and fully support them. I'm just wondering, this is not a one-off fix and until we can get something into the long-term plan, I'm wondering if we just amend the recommendation to perhaps look at reviewing the, the measures that we've put in place when appropriate or in the next six months or something uh, so that we can keep tabs on it until we've got something a bit more concrete on the lake. A question that I did have, so it's uh, the lake's been around for a long time and the, the model sailing club has been around for a long time and I've, and I've witnessed and watched them sailing and a lot of people do so it is, it is a great activity and very happy to support it. What has stopped the weed growth in the past? Is it, is it due to the weather that we've got at the moment? Is it, uh, um, David, have you got any answers on like how often would we need to clean this out? Is it something that we're going to have to do every only th every 30 years or 10 years or 20 years or is it something that once we start we might have to regularly do um, yearly? Uh, through you Worship, wish it, um, it will be an ongoing um, an ongoing issue. Uh, there has been a lot of weed growth this year due to the due to the fine weather of course an aquatic um, an aquatic weed thrives on photosynthesis when the sun's shining um, that's a food producing process of the plant. Um, so it will be ongoing. Um, I've looked at the operational budgets and there is room in there um, to continue that. Um, the recommendations from the professionals were that the um, aquatic herbicide would hit it quite hard. 
um, and dropping of the lake is pretty much to increase the leaf surface so the the aquatic herbicide can get you know a lot of contact on on the plant material um, if 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 that it will be a bit slow during the during the winter compared to summer and that's just due to the the plant's activity in the colder weather um, so we'll see how that how that goes and the option of hand weeding is as a backup um, to to um, to make that to make that work but it will be um, monitored um, and you and utilized to, to keep that area free for the radio controlled sailboat course I'd, I'd like that monitoring or reflected in the recommendation if possible just because it has taken us a long time to get to where we are today so I just want that concrete recommendation. Uh, any other questions? It's a shame that Councillor Gentle's not here as well. He's uh, he is trying um, with our IT team to, to get back on. So Councillor Broad. Uh, through you, uh, Mia Topi, I'm not sure who can answer it, must probably be David. Um, the cost in here, uh, and I don't know whether I can find it, so I might be missing it, is uh, cost per hectare. How many hectares is the lake? Uh, through you, Mia Toby, uh, it's one hectare. The, um, the course itself is about a, th a quarter to a third. Um, so it, it's it's not a, a, a you know the full length of the lake. We don't want to remove the weed um, on the other side of the lake due to the fact that it, it provides a ecosystem for the wildlife. Um, and if you if you take a chance to go and have a look, it, it's um, quite impressive at the the native fish, um, uh, enungas and 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 the duck life. Uh, one, one thing to note that typically on a hot, hot uh, summer like we've had, botulism is very prevalent in, in small lakes like this. And um, from previous experience, I've had staff that have continuously picked up dead ducks um, on a daily basis. Um, but uh, we're very lucky with, uh, with Gilmore and its ecosystem that we, there's been no botulism. Thank you. Anne-Marie, Councillor Anne-Marie, you happy to move the um, recommendation with the added of the, um, the, the monitoring? That's been moved by Councillor Spicer, seconded by Councillor Anderson. All those in favour? That's everyone, no one against. The motion is carried. Okay, now we move on to page 426, Community Facilities Report. Councillor Anne-Marie, are you happy to move that we receive the report? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Howell. All those in favour? Against carried. David, this is you again, sorry. That's all right. Um, thank you, Worship and Councillors. Uh, this report, the Community Facilities Report for April 2020, um, it includes the halls, rural halls, uh, elderly persons, housing, public toilet cemeteries and non recs. Um, this is, has been a trying time for our elderly persons, um, residents whilst going through COVID-19. Desiree has done an outstanding job with talking to them pretty much on a daily basis, uh, being very, very supportive and um, letting them know where they can go, how they can get support through EOC, which has been great. Um, she encouraged the, um, the bear hunt um, for, for, for the residents to put their teddy bears out on the windows. Uh, so as the children were walking around the neighborhood. Um, yep, I'm that, back again. Uh, it, it, was, it was good for them to see. Um, the, the production of the over the cuppa uh, the, the first bi-monthly newsletter is great. It, it um, enables them to see what's happening in their facilities um, as well as what can be offered to them. Um, the survey, you'll see the survey that was done during, during the COVID uh, level four 
uh, with some good responses to that. Um, unfortunately, there was one person who was staying uh, with one of our residents in Pyro that had to be trespassed uh, by police due to some unsavoury behaviour, but uh, that person was, was not a tenant of ours. Um, the, what the law looks like with the result of COVID-19, so there will be a rent freeze. Um, this will, um, of course, put some play into the with the rent increases that we had talked about. Um, some work has been done around that to look at what that looks like. Uh, one of the one of the niceties was the uh, spreading of some cheer just prior to lockdown gate flowers from Kirapehi, um, donated 50 bunches of flowers to the to the pensioners. So that was that was great to see. Uh, public toilets, as, as stated before, um, we did have some toilets open. They have been Marshall Street and Ohinamuri Park. And, and oh, sorry, uh, and open in Pyro was the uh, was Marshall, Marshall Street, and why he has been hazard. Um, and at Furutoa, Puhutakawa, and then Kaiawa was open as well as Waitakaruru and Tuarua. These were asked to be open by EOC so that people uh, doing essential travel um, had facilities to use. Um, they have been on a cleaning, extra cleaning service provided to us by CNM uh, three times a day. Uh, rural halls have been closed as have community halls. Um, to date, we've only had through memory three burials at our cemeteries and none of those have been COVID related. Uh, but staff have followed protocols that came through from from uh, from central government on what needed to be done with burial processes, and there's nothing to talk about at present with the non-rec reserves. Uh, looking at the projects, elderly housing project um, Natia. It's going well, a little bit over budget. Um, this is primarily due, due to the heat pumps being installed. Um, we have to install those as well as ventilation systems to align with central government healthy homes. Um, elderly housing pyro, uh, they are the same thing. And then why he is, is, is the same. There's been some additional um, insulation put into why he um, to, to be under the healthy homes. Uh, Puki Rimu Cemetery that is starting up again today. That's the development of the bottom section uh, as you first come in on the left hand side. So we've put a bisecting road in there for additional space. Uh, that is in conjunction with the Kaimanawa Water Project they're taking. Um, we're utilizing uh, removal of soil from there from Kaimanawa down to Puki Rimu, which is a bonus for us. Um, so that is um, predicted to, to finish in, in two weeks time. And the new toilets in Kaiawa, again, we're looking at um, options for, for another supplier out there. Uh, Miranda drainage um, has been completed. Cemetery drainage. Uh, are there any questions you would like for this report? Deputy Mayor has a question just on toilets. Yeah, thank you, Toby. Um, two things, one's a comment. Um, well done to Desiree for the over a cup of newsletter and her um, work that she does with those residents all of the time. They, they very much appreciate it. And that um, level of service is picked up, particularly around the communication. So well done, Desiree. And I, I love the newsletter. It's a great way to over two or three minutes pick up exactly what's going on right across that community, so well done. Uh, my question is to the toilets. Are there any savings from closing and not having to clean those toilets? And would they be outweighed much by the increased um, cleaning at some toilets? So could it be potentially a small saving there for the community? Um, unfortunately, unfortunately not with our increased um, cleaning and, and travel to those outer lying toilets, it, it's pretty much balanced it out. Any other questions for David on that report? Welcome back, uh, Councillor Gentle. It's good to see you back. 
Well, it's nice to be back too. Nothing I pushed, just one of these things that my lovely little computer likes to do. Um, apologies, but um, what page are we up to? Uh, we are just finishing uh, page 426, so the Community Facilities Report. And doesn't appear to be any further questions, so we'll move on and give David Varko a break. So thank you very much for your um, long input there. And uh, we'll come back to Adrian. So we just got the transport transport report. I'll move that we'll receive the report. And could I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Buckthorpe. All those in favour? Against carried. Adrian, welcome back. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll take the report as read and uh, just highlight some key points. So on um, page 438, um, the, we're busy reviewing the current um, maintenance contract. Um, it's coming up for renewal, um, effective 1 July next year. So in, able, in order to be able to do that, because it's a long-term contract, we've um, undertaken a section 17A review, which is a review on how we deliver um, our services um, and it's required under the Local Government Act Section 17. So that work um, is underway and um, we're looking at uh, the preparation of um, the new contract and what that would look like going forward. Um, we had undertaken a lot of work under the operational um, budgets. Unfortunately that came to a halt when we moved into level four. Um, and you'll see on bottom of page 438 and 439 the effects of that. Um, the effects of drought, if I can just flag that for your attention, um, we have discussed this previously. Um, we have started some work. We've spent uh, in the region of just over $100,000 doing some work in some uh, emergency stabilization of the roads that have been affected. And if you can just drop down to Appendix B um, on page um, 449, apologies for the old logo, we have updated that with the uh, contractor. Um, you'll see the roads that have been most affected by the drought. So if it is red, the road has been significantly affected by the drought orange it has been affected but not as badly and green there's been no visible effect. The starred sites are the sites that are particularly bad and we've had to undertake emergency repairs um, on those locations. The expected repair bill for this is um, we haven't finalized it but we expect it to be in the region of about one to two million dollars and we are busy working through with NZTA um, is that will um, potentially require additional funding and um, we hopefully that will be at the higher funding rate of 80 percent but we're busy working through with NZTA on that um, matter. Um, moving on from there um, on page 440 um, the just the ultra fast broadband it's been absolutely brilliant i think for most of us that have it over the COVID shutdown but it has brought some pain as you're aware and we're busy still working through that it is important to note that we haven't actually signed off any of the works as yet um, and we're busy working through with the um, contractors on, on settlement of some outstanding uh, costs Capital projects, um, we had managed to complete our reseals project earlier this year um, and the pavement rehab project I scheduled for this work this year. The rehab that is sitting at 85% is the preparation for next year's work, the design for next year. Um, initially, we weren't going to, um, recommendation was to not do any work on Pippa Row Road and just do some heavy maintenance as opposed to a rehab. Uh, the drought has now changed that outlook and as a result um, we're busy uh, preparing the documents for that. Under minor improvements a number of them have been delayed as a result of COVID um, but we'll get back up and board running as soon as we are able to which is um, and hopefully we've got some of them away now. 
On page 441, Mahuta Road North or, or Ross Road North, um, bridge number two, um, the bridge is in very poor condition. We've had it uh, reviewed by uh, some structural engineers. And as a result of that and their recommendations, I've given an instruction <clears throat> for the bridge um, load class to be reduced sub substantially. Um, that will be posted on the um, bridge. And also we will reduce the speed limit um, down to 10 k's an hour. Um, a report uh, detailing more information will come to the council um, as long as, as well as an options report about the different options we have for that, um, including um, keeping it at a single lane to move into a double lane bridge. Um, so that report um, will come to council as soon as the consultants have completed that um, work. Um, moving on through the report. Um, the on page 443 um, the asset management side of under 2.3 um, the NZTA we were audited by NZTA on our procedures for the activity and um, generally we got a good report um, with one or two improvements needed so that was um, really proud of how the team has has pulled things together and got us into a really good uh, place. And there was really positive report uh, from um, the auditors of NZTA. Uh, then on page triple four uh, under COVID implications, um, the Pre-seal repairs um, that we hadn't completed, we, we, what we have done is, is that we've, as I indicated, we, um, some of the roads that were significantly damaged by the drought, what we have done is, is that we've had to um, stabilize them just um, to get through winter because we're unfortunately un going to be unable to undertake any um, significant works to, to repair them with the start of winter. And as a result, what we have done is, is that we've done emergency repairs to uh, several of them and also um, we are trying to seal the cracks in that in it to prevent uh, water getting in over the wet season and that should hopefully hold them from further um, breakdown over the winter months. Um, I'll take any questions on the report now. Any questions councillors? <clears throat> Councillor Gento. <clears throat> Yeah, through you, me, Toby, um, it's not about your report, actually. It's just to see whether I can get a follow-up in regard to uh, Devon Street, uh, Adrian. It's been a wee while, and I know uh, COVID-19 sort of come in there. Uh, a couple of people asking in regard to whether there could be some yellow dotted lines put down one side. It's uh, in between Mitre 10 and New World, and it gets quite busy. I know you've monitored it in the past. Has that continued, or has a decision been made? Where are we at with that? Um, before COVID, the guys had undertaken some work on this. Um, I think it's probably uh, gone to back of mind at the moment, but um, I do know that they have uh, started doing some work in that space um, and we'll uh, come to the council probably in the next month or two with some options um, as to what may or may not be done in that space. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and again, it's not in your report, but I'm not sure where this comes up. Uh, stop me if it's the wrong place, but St. James Church Building in Moresby Ave, Heritage New Zealand, changed the historical protection category and name. Is that in this department? I mean, we talk about this now. Is, I mean, does the council know about it, the change in it? Uh, or is that historical? I don't think it has anything to do with us. Um, no, okay. Langley? No, not, not a council decision. Um, so it's got nothing to do with council. So yeah. has, the council hasn't been informed? I'd have to look at Peter in terms of whether the planners have been advised to a change of its classification. Okay, I just had a couple of a uh, bit, bit of feedback from the public saying that um, they were changing it. It needs to be retained. It's category one, but uh, I, I don't know too much about it. I did hear about it a couple of years ago when they put it up onto Trade Me, but that fell over, uh, and that's just sort of come through recently. Um, so I had my shoulder tapped so to bring it up today. No, and we're not aware of any changes. You 
best to put that through as an email to the one of the, the group manager to to follow up on um, Brian. Thanks, Lanny. We'll do. Any further questions, Councillor Broad? Uh, thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, suppose to Adrian and Langley, at an earlier meeting or late last year, we talked about um, some signs to slow down on River Road Nartia where the um, Sonic Lodges turn off is into Factory Lane and also the daycare centre. Well, the road work's been going on Nartia, they've put a lower speed limit in that area. But we did talk about um, having some more signage permanently and it was suggested by South Langley that um, use the red paint on the road to do slow. Is that still um, going to be included in our budget um, for when road marking is going to happen in Nartia? Because clearly they're going to be coming to do some work on River Road shortly where the resealing has been done. Can we tie it in when the road marking people are there at the same stage? Um, we normally give it um, a short uh, time delay between them because otherwise um, the paint fades a wee bit, but yes, it is intended to take place um, at the same time. Um, the, there's several locations in the district where we're going to be painting with red paint and River Road is one of them, and it, it was planned for this uh, financial year. Uh, just uh, while I wanted to rain, um, the, yeah, we, we're now six weeks delayed, so I'm not quite sure how we will go through weather. Thanks, thanks for that, Adrian. It was just a clarification and just some, uh, I can just uh, advise people in the area um, that it asked again. Thank you. So no further questions. Um, yeah, just, and that's another reminder about the drought, just how, how much of an effect the drought's having on us. Um, we're, we're probably gonna spend uh, a lot more money for drought conditions and repairs to, to roads than we will. Um, as far as COVID goes, so uh, it's it's not been a nice uh, nice nice time for for anybody, particularly our rural community, and our roads are taking some real punishment from it. So, if there's no further questions for Adrian on the transport report, we'll move on to our water services report. Uh, before we go into our water service report, I just note that uh, Councillor Gentle uh, had to vacate due to circumstances beyond his control. Uh, his laptop decided that uh, it was time for him to leave. And it was unfortunate that we were discussing some topics that he wanted to talk about, which was the um, the hockey turf in Nartia and, and possibly might want to make comment on Gilmore Lake. So uh, even though those motions have passed, um, you, you may um, pass thank on your wisdom to us, Councillor Gentle. That'll be short and sweet. Uh, thank you, Mayor Toby. Um, just in regard to the Thames Valley hockey, um, I'm all for it. I'm quite happy to support um, what the, um, the Nartia councillors uh, think of it. Um, I think it's a great facility for the community. My questions were, it was a grant up to 20,000. Um, I'm guessing we're looking at giving them 20,000. It still leaves them 32,000. Have they got that 32,000 or is that like we're giving them 20 and then we're waiting to see if and when they get that other 32,000? Um, should we put a time on it saying, we'll give you the 20,000, you've got them till I don't know, February of 2021 to get the other 32,000 or we'll sit on it until you need it. And are there any other maintenance costs likely to come up? If the lights are 30 years old, how old's the turf? That was really my question. Ross, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, Ross will add those answers, but there are, um, there's a separate fund for turf replacement, which um, covers that, um, which, is, which is covered through the plains. It's, it's not just Nartia, it's the, it's the Plains Ward, so we've got to remember that. They, they Sorry, apologies. It's a whole yep, yep. large area, not just uh, Nartia Township. Okay. Councillor Harris. Yeah, through you, Mayor Toby, to, to Councillor Gentle. Um, the, 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 the difference between the 120 that uh, they've got 100 already, uh, our 20, uh, the balance will be a bank loan. Uh, they have the equity available to do that. Um, pardon me, and Mayor Toby is correct that there is a depreciation fund that uh, is being funded by both the ward and the district uh, for turf replacement. Thank you. Appreciate the update. No worries. What about Gilmore Lake? Did you have anything for the, the weeds or are you happy? 
Um, no, I think we had a, a uh, Wahi Ward meeting in regard to that yesterday, and uh, there was a bit of discussion on that, and I was quite happy with what the um, the outcome of that was. Uh, a bit anti when it comes to uh, chemicals, and I don't think the black swans were very popular either. So I'll go with the flow on that one. Well, that's lucky because we you have been put forward as one of the uh, volunteers to get in the lake and hand pull out the weed. So we appreciate your support on that, Councillor Gentle. I really appreciate that, Mayor Toby. Can I borrow your speedos? <laughs> okay, we'll move on to uh, page 453 in our Water Services Monthly Activity Report. Councillor Harris, you happy to move that we receive the report? Thank you. And Councillor Garrett, you happy to second it? He's not quite there, so we'll go with Councillor Smeaton, who did put up his hand. Thank you, Councillor Smeaton. All those in favour? Okay, it's carried. Oh, there he is. He's, he's with us. Adrian. Okay, Your Worship. Um, I'd just like to, before I start the report, acknowledge the water services team. Um, they're an essential service and the treatment team has worked through the whole of this COVID and made sure that we've had safe water for our communities. They've been in very lockdown bubbles um, and we've been delivering food packages to them so that they don't interact with anybody else. Um, we've actually had an A and a B team, um, and so we, we've had to keep them a lockdown. Um, on, and it is in the report, but just the type of thing that they've had to do is on day one of lockdown, that night, one of the primary pumps at, uh, for, for Kilapahi blew, and they had to get a new motor down from Auckland. It didn't fit properly, they had to get it across to an engineering firm in the middle of the night and get it uh, drilled out and then back in and they had water running again by midnight that night uh, with help from Peter Smith as well. So they've been fantastic in that time. And the retech team as well um, have made sure that everybody's um, had safe water. So yeah, um, shout out to them. Um, the water supply, um, Obviously, this, this covers primarily uh, March. Um, there were a whole lot of renewals underway um, that got closed down um, at the during the COVID, but they were back up and running again yesterday. Um, and so that is uh, good. Um, the water treatment um, operations notebook, I've, I've covered um, some of that. Um, but just at the moment, Titi's quarry um, water level is just below 40% now. Um, we really are going to uh, start needing some rain quite soon. And under the water restrictions section in this report, um, the Wahi is still under restrictions. Um, the gauge that we take our reading from is still well below our resource consented level to be able to increase the take up to our full amount. So as a result of that, um, we're on a reduced intake from the river and um, we're having to uh, keep the water restrictions in place. Um, the levels are not far above um, all town record lows and have been below um, that record low up till the recent rain, but even now that hasn't recovered very much. Um, then um, moving on to the wastewater, um, you will be aware that um, we have reported it before that we had a dry weather overflow in Tura and we are looking at uh, challenging that um, formal warning um, and that, that is underway. Um, a number of the uh, works in that area were put on hold um, as a result of COVID, but um, they'll be they're back up and running again. Um, moving down um, the uh, planned works. Um, yeah, we've, we've been doing a lot of work on upgrading the pump stations and repairing the communications on that. Um, and that work has gained, has had to be on hold, um, but we'll continue that um, once, um, or we've started continuing that now already. Moving on to stormwater. This, uh, some work was done in March um, and then we've put it on hold um, and um, we're starting to pick that up uh, again. 
At the end of the report on page 459, EJ gives uh, quite a bit of detail around um, what's happening with the team um, for the COVID response and impact. Um, but generally, um, the team has gone really, really well, um, and um, the, they've coped um, fantastically well, actually. Um, the construction work um, on some of the major capital projects started again yesterday, so the Kamanawa a water scheme and some of the uh, wastewater capital projects, but they have been delayed by um, quite some time and we won't have them completed as planned at the end of this financial year. Um, are there any questions on the report? No, no questions, but um, just, just back to your staff. Um, I mean, everybody's working tirelessly, and, and uh, particularly in the water and wastewater, they're the unsung heroes of our community, really. Uh, they're, they're never really seen, um, but they're out there at all, all types of the, the weather um, and throughout this process, making sure that everybody's been able to drink water and flush their toilets um, appropriately. So um, let me just pass on our thanks, Adrian. I know it's trying conditions with the, with the drought and breaking pipes um, and uh, uh, there's probably been a lot more people at home um, clogging up um, sewer networks and, and we've been going out hard with the wet wipes campaign, mm -hmm. um, but we know that that's still an issue within our district and uh, they've been working. So uh, fantastic. Great. Thank you. No further questions for Adrian on, on that report. We can, we can move on. So no, we'll move on to page uh, 464 and the solid waste. I, Solid waste report. Let's bring that up. My apologies. People can have cell phones going in the background. I can make a mistake every now and again. We're all, we're all just human. And uh, Duncan, you happy to move that we receive the report? Oh, sorry, we do have someone with his hand up. He did have it laid up. So apologies. Councillor Harris, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Toby. Yes, I did have my hand up, but but as I was putting my hand up, uh, you re basically reiterated what I was going to uh, uh, to say. And congratulations to EJ and the the whole team uh, throughout this very very trying time. Awesome, thank you, Ross. So page six four sixty four uh, waste management monthly activity report. Councillor Smith, you happy to move that we receive the report? Thank you. Do I have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. All those in favour? Against carried. Adrian, lovely topic of rubbish. Okay, I'll take the report as read. Um, the first part of the month, um, March, was business as usual, and then the last part of the month was um, frantically preparing for um, COVID uh, as we moved into stage three and then into stage four. Um, Initially, there was um, it was just it was we got the message out really well, um, and there was, there was some confusion, but not a whole lot of confusion. And I would love to again um, express my thanks to the communications team for the fantastic job they did in getting that message out um, across the district. The feedback from the contractors, because they actually drove around the, the town and had a look at that, um, and if people had put out bags, they didn't notify them but the uptake and, and the uh, response from the community was fantastic, so they're to be commended um, for that. Um, we've had very few um, issues with the process um, and it has gone um, reasonably well. Um, the report um, covers the um, total transport tonnage, including March, which um, and also then has the diversion um, refuse that has gone to landfill. I mean, refuse that has been recycled going forward uh, for up to that period. Now, it must be noted that for the shutdown period uh, level uh, four and level three, all recycling that is collected um, is going to landfill, so that is going to severely um, affect the um, targets that we have set in terms of diversion. Um, 
and obviously the waste minimization targets will be affected as well as um, with the recycling being included in that. Um, the RTS sites, um, the resource consent is being um, finalized for the um, RTS in Paro for it to be able to be utilized as part of it for a reuse center. And I'd like to uh, congratulate Councillor Smeaton on being able to secure the majority of the funding required uh, for that project. Um, and so hopefully as soon as the consent is uh, granted, we'll be able to get into the physical works for that site. Wahi RTS, um, the concrete works is getting underway um, this week um, and the, um, the site um, will be um, very, very restricted in terms of being able to access it because of the location of the concrete that has to uh, be placed there. Um, and so that work is underway um, under level three and ho should hopefully be finished um, under level three. Um, the, I'll take any uh, questions on the report, um, if anybody's got any questions. Uh, we'll go Councillor Milner first and then Councillor Smeaton and we just congratulate Councillor Smeaton. Obviously he wasn't just talking a load of rubbish when he was delivering his uh, information to us and uh, he got some good results out of it. Councillor Milner. Thank you, Mia Toby. Um, it's a slightly long question, but I'll, if I ask the whole thing, then Adrian be able to respond um, as best he can. So just on the current waste situation, I don't think we can continue as it is until level one, which is how I'm reading what the report's saying. Happy to be corrected if that's wrong. But the additional costs that our rate payers will, will incur will be quite substantial and we don't really know that. So that's a bit of an unknown for me. Um, people have been very patient and understanding and have worked with the system as best they can. Um, the response to level three and four was entirely appropriate. So commend SMART for getting that set up and running quickly. The comms was difficult, but well done to the team for getting the message out and well done for people for telling their neighbors if they saw they had bags out and et cetera. So that was pretty good. But for me, there's no reason that recycling services can't fully start at level two. I'll be interested to hear the reasoning why the contractor thinks they can't start up the MRF sites. Um, but I also note Smart Environment have applied for the wage subsidy and I've got that to the tune of 1.7 million. So I'd be interested to know what those staff are potentially going to be doing if they can't work for six months or more. And further to that point, if the contractor is not able to reasonably provide the service we contract them for, does that contract then need to end? Now, I understand it's a bit of a long question, but if Adrian could respond to that as, as much as he can, please. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. Um, in terms of um, recycling level uh, three or level two, um, the, we're working with Wastemans, which is the national body, and um, they are preparing um, some guidelines for us nationally as to how we move to level, uh, what, what we can do uh, between level four to level three to level two to level one. Um, at this stage, um, my understanding is, is, is that we might be able to undertake some recycling at level two. The problem we have with our MIRF is that um, the recycling is undertaken very manually, and um, that is why we can't do any recycling at this stage. In terms of whether we're able to do recycling at level two, we're hoping to have uh, more guidance on that shortly, but um, at the time of uh, preparing the report, that was the information we had from the contractor, but I believe uh, your comments are possibly correct, and it's likely that we might be able to restart recycling at level two. Um, as soon as we uh, do have more guidance on that, we'll be able to provide that. Um, that was level two, level, and the, as I indicated, the uh, body that we work with is Waste Mins, which is the national body, and um, they do provide guidance uh, across uh, for us. Um, in terms of the costs, um, we're not certain um, what the costs might or might not be. Um, it is something that's going to be quite a complicated process, but we obviously will keep the councillors informed as to um, what the 
uh, total costs to us will be, but there will definitely be costs incurred, and not just for this contract, but for all of our contracts as a result of uh, COVID level uh, four and, and uh, for some for COVID level three. Um, the in terms of them having received uh, funding, unfortunately, I'm, I'm unable to comment on that. Uh, does that cover your questions? So just thank you for that. That's that's covered off quite a lot of it. Um, so the, the further bit was, would the contract potentially end or have to be amended if they can't provide that service in a reasonable fashion? Um, it would depend whether it's as a result of them not wanting to or with a result of them not being able to because of uh, government regulation. If it's the latter, then no. If it's the former that they just choose not to, then we would have some conversations with them. But if they are able to, it's unlikely that they would not. Councillor Smeaton. Um, Adrian, is it true that the MRF at uh, COPU is not going to be operating until, uh, I think it's January 21? And uh, so that's a lot of recycling that's not going on and it's just all been chucked into landfill. It all sounds just a bit kind of easy from um, Smart's point of view. Um, as I indicated to um, the Deputy Mayor, um, it's likely that we will be able to recycle under level two. Um, but we're busy waiting for direction from Wastemans in that space. If the direction is, is that we're not able to until we get to level one, then we will need to look at alternatives uh, for recycling. Um, and um, but do agree with you that it's it's not it's not going to be good to continue not recycling for a long period of time. Um, they certainly would want to get recycling as soon as possible because they're suffering a loss of income as a result of not being able to do the recycling. So, um, but we are waiting for that guidance. Any further questions? Um, I mean, we, uh, the public has been um, uh, outraged at one point and then um, very understanding at another point. We must thank them because they have uh, endured some some tough times and, and rubbish has been a hot topic, probably the hottest topic of, of COVID-19, um, along with a, a loss of flour and um, baking powder and uh, not the ability to be able to get toilet paper when they need it. But the, certainly the, the rubbish, but um, the way in which people have been storing their recycling has, has been fantastic. And the way that we did the messaging, while we can't get to absolutely everybody, the, the way in which we did it, we, we got to a fair, fair portion of the community, which was fantastic. And then those people were sharing the messages along. So uh, it's been more and more you go out, there's hardly been any yellow bags out on site. And, and I get their frustrations um, about having to purchase an extra yellow bag. But yeah, I just, I just thank them for this time. And uh, I can assure them and other councillors that we're going to work through this and um, put a lot of time and effort in to make sure that uh, it's not an un, un, unburdenly cost to the rest of the ratepayers um, for the ability of losing recycling. Councillor Broad, you had a question? He did have a question, but he's um, been frozen and kicked off like Brian. Um, I just want to, if there are people out there watching, I haven't kicked anybody off, but it's not me that's kicking people off. <laughs> so I don't want anybody to think that. So uh, he'll come back. So if there's no further questions uh, for Adrian on the waste management or the solid waste, we'll move on to the next item, which is our district drainage activity. Just before, and Councillor Philip Buckford, are you happy to move that or receive the report? Yes, and can I have a seconder, please? Thank you, Sarah Howell, Councillor Howell. All those in favour? Gains carried. Just before we move on to, just before we get Adrian to go there, I've just had some, so somebody is watching uh, the report, which is great, uh, the council meeting live. And one of the questions that, um, or a point that was noted to me is that I've been talking with Federated Farmers and Duncan and Philip, you'll be able to answer better than me and probably Ross. Um, whilst we've been in a drought situation, um, production wise, they've actually had a fantastic year. Um, and that's why there's probably not so much, much grief out there. So that's come from Federated Farmers that they've had a, a, a bumper year as far as production goes. Um, but yes, they will be drying off a lot earlier and that there's a lot out there frantically 
planting seed at the at the present time, um, hoping for a little bit of rain over the weekend that we're supposed to get to help that help that grow. So that's what's come through. Adrian. Oh, Councillor Smeaton, sorry. I can see your hand up. Um, well, I'm really surprised to hear that, uh, Toby, and I'd probably want to know what uh, region or area they're referring to when they're saying that uh, production's been really great. I do know that the, I think the west coast of the North Island hasn't been as badly affected as the east coast, and certainly the uh, Hauraki district has been badly drought affected from a farming perspective. So I'm only getting it from uh, from federated farmers that the region will see a record year. So um, I'm, I'm presuming that's the Waikato region. I, I, I'm just reading the information I've got. Councillor Anne-Marie Spicer, and then Councillor Buckle. Um, the comments that I made earlier were backed up by Katie McLaren, who's been speaking to people on civil defence calls too. So I'm really interested in what where that's come from as well, um, um, because that's not what we're hearing anecdotally. So it would be really good to just just get a bit more information on where that's come from, yeah. Councillor Buckthorpe. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Look, I can probably put a bit of light on that uh, report, simply because um, the payout has increased to a higher level this year. A lot of farmers are geared up to put more feed into their systems through, um, through in-shed feeding, feed pads. So they really ramp, when, when there's a, when there's an increase in payout, it's more economical to ramp more feed into the system, which in turn increases production. Uh, at the other end of the scale, you, you'll see the increase in production, but you don't see the cost structures that go with that. Um, there will be an ongoing cost structure to keep feeding cows even while they're dry, because they still need to, to eat. And uh, when, when um, feed supplies diminish, then generally prices go up. So although the, the production is up, I think you'll find that the um, profitability will either be the same or less. So uh, I hope that sort of uh, puts a bit of light on it. Was that a wanting to speak, Councillor Smeaton, or just a, no, just a, just a thumbs up? Got that bit. So Adrian, uh, the report's been received. Um, the uh, drainage activity report. I'm sorry, I couldn't find my mouse to unmute myself. Um, the Alteca report has read, um, and if we can uh, move to um, page 472, the second one, um, vegetation control. Um, we have sprayed the majority of the network. Um, and so um, we will hopefully be able to do a bit more of the, uh, because they started spraying again uh, as of yesterday, and hopefully we'll get that um, completed. The uh, teams have also started um, the removal of weeds through mechanical cleaning, and um, the, so the, that's different to mechanical cleaning, but they've started dredging the weeds uh, from the various drains. And that is usually an activity that's undertaken in sort of April, May. And so that's uh, getting underway at the moment. Some of the drains have actually had quite substantial weed growth. Um, mechanical cleaning, the majority of it is um, has been completed or is underway and hopefully we'll be able to complete that. If you look at table one over leaf, um, over the page, page 473, um, we've still got some drains to be cleaned. We have retained a substantial amount of money, it was about sixty or $70,000 in the budget to undertake the cleaning of hot springs in Corrida. That is now unlikely to be undertaken. We're waiting for a resource consent um, and we are unlikely to get the resource consent this uh, financial year. So um, we will need to see if we can uh, utilize that money for the cleaning of other drains. Um, so that we can do uh, those two grants once we get the works um, in next year's. Um, we've started, um, we've done the survey of various stock banks and we're starting to plan the capital works for that, um, as indicated on the bottom of page 473. Um, and then on um, 470, page 474, um, it discusses some of the issues we're having with the resource consent and just um, getting 
it uh, to be resolved over this time. Um, over the since February, we've um, had elections for the drainage committees. Their term um, came up, and we called for nominations for the drainage committees. That closed on the 30th of March in the COVID period. And um, we are, have got uh, memberships uh, uh, nominations as included in uh, further down. We'll have a look at that. Um, we've indicated the delegations there that the drainage committees have. Um, and then um, we've indicated on page 475 the um, various, the four drainage committees and the nominations for members under each of that. We did not get any areas that had more than one nomination, and therefore there was no need for us to undertake an election in that particular drainage area. Um, and the appointment of those uh, committee uh, members that have been nominated um, is a recommendation of this report. Um, and so, um, the staff recommend that those persons whose names have been put forward be appointed to the drainage committees in accordance with the table on page 475. Are there any questions on this report? Questions, comments? Councillor Buckle. Thank you, Mayor Toby. Uh, just a comment, uh, really, um, around the um, the WRC requests for the resource consent. Um, I've had I've had discussions with Toby and and Ross and uh, Langley and Adrian about it. Um, I'm really unhappy about it. I think they are being absolutely ridiculous with the requests, it's it's basically grounds for us not being able to fulfill our um, uh, requirements under, under our service agreement and um, something needs to be done about it. I'm not sure how we do it. Uh, I know Adrian and Langley are sort of scratching their heads too, but um, uh, it, it just can't carry on like this. And I wanted to make that comment in front of all the councillors and whoever might be listening. So um, I'd, I'd like to politicise it a bit more and, uh, and take it higher up within WRC. Mm. So uh, I think that's the way forward. Um, hopefully we can get a resolution on it so that we can actually function because un under their requests, that's uh, just ridiculous. And I would like to recommend that the drainage committees be uh, endorsed by council. Thank you. So that's been moved by uh, Councillor Buckthorpe for that uh, resolution. And Ross, did you second that? Yes, you did. Thank you. Langley, did you have any um, comments? No, sorry, I thought you were just about to speak. My apologies. So we'll take that into advisement, uh, Councillor Buckthorpe. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further questions on the drainage reports? No, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Against carry. So just um, welcome back, Councillor Ray Broad. You um, vamoosed there. I don't know if it was internet or uh, Councillor Brian Gentle kicked you off because he felt like he was the only one that was kicked out. But you had a question for solid waste. so. Um, we'll go back um, and, uh, and hear your question before we close the meeting off. Uh, thanks, Mayor Toby. Yeah, sorry, the internet went down and it took a while to rehook back up, so uh, we're all sorted again. Um, solid waste, just one question. There was a temporary bottle drop um, bin put in Natia, so I don't know if this question was asked by Ross. We discussed it at our Plains uh, Ward meeting. Um, can we look at having that uh, retained within Nati? It's been quite a, a well-used facility, and I think we need to find an area for it. It, um, pr it provides an area that saves people having to drive um, the Pyro or Thames to uh, remove that part of their recycling. So I think it's just uh, a helpful um, part. So uh, whether it's Langley or Adrian. The other one is just a follow-up on the footpath in Nati, and in particular, um, uh, a 
Adrian, that uh, some applications were put through to the government for um, shovel-ready projects and um, also footpath rehabilitation to have, whether we've had response uh, regards those applications and just where we are with the project management and the tendering uh, for localised tenders for the footpath in Natia. So there's a few questions in there. Okay. So, um, Councillor Ray, those questions should have been emailed through. That's got nothing to do with um, waste management. On um, so yeah, certainly a bottle one. That's um, definite. And I, I believe there's a property on River Road um, that's open to having one um, just sit outside the front gate, so we can put that there. But that's something we'll work on. But the other ones we'll need to. Uh, there's a few more questions that need to be answered in that one. And uh, government hasn't uh, released any information on any of the um, shovel ready or shovel worthy or whatever they, uh, their new phrase at the moment is for those projects hasn't come out yet. So we haven't, haven't had any indication, but uh, we'll get those questions emailed out. So if there's no further questions, I just want to thank everybody for, for being here today. It's uh, a little bit different than we've done in the past, and it's um, it's run relatively smooth smoothly. We've we haven't had too many um, awkward moments on camera. The odd the odd nose itch that could be looked at as a pick, but we'll just call them nose itches, and uh, the odd computer glitch where it's gone down. But uh, all in all, it's been quite successful, I think, for our first first live meeting and first uh, meeting where we've um, all done it from home. It's been something something new and challenging for all of us, and. Uh, I'm just thankful for the Makona that we've finally got Makona at our council meetings. That's something that's been great. Something we've asked for for a long time. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to staying home more now uh, so I can have more uh, Makona coffees. Uh, I, I want to thank uh, at times we've had 40 to 50 to 60 people watching live, which has been absolutely fantastic. So um, long may that continue. I, 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 I kind of hope that once we get back into the council chambers that we can set up and run our meetings um, uh, live so that we can have more interaction from from the community that's been fantastic and, and great so i'm looking forward to that and uh if there's nothing further else we'll close the meeting and i'll close it with a karakia and wish everyone uh, a good afternoon and uh hopefully um everyone has a, a great rest of the week and uh just keep in touch keep in touch with each other the the, the meetings that we've been having with the wards has been great um, but just make sure that they're each each and every one of us is out there to support one another throughout this time. And uh, it's going to be challenging for a, for a long time yet. Um, and, and the worst is yet to come, I think, with some of it. So uh, on that note, I'll, I'll close it. Kia whakai ria te tapu. Kia wata ai te ara. Kia tuaruki whakatahia ai humia e hui e taiki e. And... Uh, Thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your day in the sun. Uh, let's pray for a little bit of rain. Just want to see who's the last to leave. That's us. Well done. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Paul. No, that went well, didn't it?